I think uh, we have a, a quorum, so uh, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Alderman Kennedy. Here. Alderman Boyd. Present. Alderwoman Davis. Present. Alderman Kotar. Alderman Ogilvy. Here. Alderwoman Boyd. Alderman Bosley. Present. Alderman Oldenburg. Here. Chairman Rohde. Present. President Reed. Here. Eight present. You have a quorum. Uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, this is our first uh, meeting where we're considering any tax abatement or TIF or anything like that since we went down on summer uh, break. And uh, we had a little bit of miscommunication. We uh, passed the resolution on incentive reform out at our last meeting. And I was out of town uh, visiting my son away at school. Uh, several Fridays ago, so uh, there was a bit of miscommunication, and the the resolution was passed from the floor without much discussion. It was my intent to to be present at that and, and give some background on it. Um, so you all were spared, uh, uh, you know, a 15-minute oration on what we did with the incentives. But I felt like I should at least take a minute or two and provide some explanation on what happened. I became chairman in the, uh, of the HUDS committee in uh, 2014, and, uh, and I spent about a year studying incentives myself. And then in 20, uh, and how the city was using them, in 2015, we had a kickoff here where, we, uh, where I kind of called for a review of the incentives, and, and that started a uh, several year process. We went ahead and had the incentive study that was performed that uh, SLDC uh, did for us. Uh, and then uh, as an outgrowth of that, they hired a financial analyst. We've gone ahead and built a model, and much of last year we were beta testing that model, trying to understand it and see how it was applicable. Um, and my, my, we received a great deal of criticism during that time period that we were continuing to uh, support tax abatement incentives bills while we were beta testing the model. My, uh, my defense of that process was, was that many of these projects required you know, a year or two lead time and that uh, uh, we were trying to get developers to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars in many cases in a project before they even uh, broke ground. And uh, if we would uh, go ahead and change the rules in the middle of the game, we could really have a very disruptive process and, and really hurt us. So we went ahead and continued to use those. And at last summer's break, I have uh, our, our executive director here who's been extremely cooperative throughout this whole process and a good partner of ours over here. We have a little game that we play from time to time where I say, you know, if this isn't happening fast enough, I'm going to shut down the HUDS committee and we're not going to hear any more bills. And um, uh, he very graciously tries to accelerate whatever the problem is. And so we've been working on this incentive resolution for a while, and we were trying to get it done uh, by the end of the summer. And uh, our, our dedicated financial analyst over there is, uh, you know, had a number of other things coming up in addition to the Amazon uh, proposal and some other issues. Um, we were slowed down, and my intent was, was to hold off on these hearings that we're having today until we actually had that model done. But um, uh, prior to the summer, the older woman from the sixth ward was over here and we kind of had an informal agreement that if we got these incentives done that we would, uh, uh, you know, the resolution done that we would uh, all kind of put a truce to that, uh, our di disagreements. Part of our challenge down here is, is we have 28 aldermen and we have 29 different views about how we should use incentives, when we should use them. And the idea was was that we would have a, a kind of a set of ground rules so that we wouldn't have all this confusion and when the developer would come before us that we would have uh, some predictable path for them. Well, the older woman from the sixth uh, felt that I was a, a little heavy handed and that I was expecting her agreement prior to the incentives being, uh, the resolution being passed. And so that's when we decided to put the brakes on everything. No, that was the older woman from the sixth uh, on a resolution that she had down here. And so we, we hadn't really had any of these uh, board bills he held, heard in front of my committee since the summer. 
and, and uh, it was my intent to wait. Uh, however, the alderwoman from the 15th has advised us that she had a project in her ward that uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, been moving slowly through the process and is ready now to advance and that uh, failure to have a hearing today would jeopardize that project. And so uh, as a courtesy to her and uh, in fairness, since we went ahead and heard many of my bills last year and, and uh, I was concerned about the viability of them if they weren't given a hearing, we decided to go ahead and expedite this and so we're having this hearing today. We did pass the incentive resolution. It is not as tight as I think a number of us would have liked, but we wanted to go ahead and get that passed before we started having more board bills. Our hope is, is that we would come back in six months uh, with a little bit tighter resolution on incentive reform that, that uh, you know, begins uh, more succinctly uh, expressing, you know, how and when we might use those. So with that as a backdrop, that's why we passed the incentive resolution and it wasn't quite as uh, tight as I would have liked to, and that's why we're here today. So um, with that kind of preamble, we have a number of bills before us today that, uh, that we're seeking um, uh, our support. The board bill that I was sponsoring, 138, can be postponed. We will be having another hearing later this month uh, the, uh, in November. Uh, part of our goals of doing uh, uh, incentive reform was to start understanding and measuring the performance of those. And so uh, our colleague from the 16th Ward has uh, graciously kind of taken over our performance measure project and our hope is, is by the end of the month, we would be able to have a presentation on that as well so that we'll have a, a committee hearing at the end of the month to take up a couple board bills, but it will be kicked off with an update on our performance measures. So um, we'll go ahead and postpone 138. Uh, 181 is uh, by a member of our committee, so we'll hold that last, uh, but we have several board bills that um, we think will not take very long, and then we will circle back and take board bill number one, uh, 101 after we take board bills 185, 142, and 146. Uh, Alderwoman Spencer is the sponsor of 185. Normally we would call on her at this time, but she is running a little bit late, so we will uh, provide the alderman from the 21st an opportunity to step up if he's okay. present. Yeah, I thought I saw yeah, him here. Good. There he is. Oh, okay. Uh, alderman uh, Muhammad has board bills number 142 and 146. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, board Bill 142 uh, and 146 are just redevelopment plans in North St. Louis. Board Bill 142 is a 10-year tax abatement for uh, one of my most poverty-stricken blocks uh, in a ward. That's the 4400 block of Red Bud Avenue. Uh, along that block, four houses are actually residential. The rest are uh, LRA or just vacant and condemned property. So we are trying to make that area um, uh, more attractive to developers and more attractive to contractors to come in and do something with. Uh, Board Bill 146 is a redevelopment plan on Natural Bridge Avenue. Uh, Alderman, I'm sorry, I, I know you're kind of new at this. We usually take them one at a time. So what we'll do is, is uh, if oh, we see, can I'm talk. I'm ready to move here. Yeah, <laughs> we'll take care of 142 first. Sure. Um, and um, do you have, um, some specific information about that then. Like, what, what do you want to know exactly? Or do you usually have, do you they have, have a specific like a, question? Yeah, yeah, yeah usually, usually they have pictures or photographs or a little description for us. So I thought you out. had a copy of it already. Now, the reason this is before our committee is that some of these buildings are occupied. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes, Mr. Chairman. And 
I, in anticipation of some of the other committee members' questions, is there any eminent domain in this board bill at all? Or No. Okay. Uh, do you have anything you'd like to add before we go through the committee and provide them a chance to ask questions? No, sir. No, okay. no further comment. Uh, Alderman, do you have our, you got my cheat, our list here. Alderman Kennedy, do you have any questions? No, no questions. Uh, Alderman Boyd, any questions? Sure. Is there a developer at this time? No, sir. I'm trying to make it more attractive for a developer. Uh, I'm pretty sure, as you already know, Alderman is pretty hard to bring a developer into North City. No further questions. Um, Alderwoman Davis. I don't have any questions, but I shall say to you that I know this area well. And it's a good place to concentrate first. Um, I think that could bring a lot of attention uh, and hopefully encourage some other people to come in and invest. That's my only comment, sir. Uh, Alderman Kotar is not present. Uh, Alderman Ogilvie. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. So this is a little different than bills we typically see because there's no developer and it's an area, um, it authorizes tax abatement for this area, but we don't know for what potential projects, correct? Is there, uh, how, is, how are these two blocks different from near block, nearby blocks? Like how is this location determined amongst all the potential locations where we, you could do this sort of perspective authorization for tax abatement in advance of a plan or a developer or a project? Um, if, if I could actually offer tax abatement for every block in the ward, I would. Uh, but this particular block is uh, filled with crime, vacant property, dilapidated housing, and no economic development whatsoever surrounding it. Uh, it is one of my two worst of blocks in the ward. And this is, and this is one of the blocks that residents have the most problems with. Uh, this particular stretch on Redwood Avenue is between West Florissant and Penrose. Uh, if I go towards the Penrose Inn, it's a pretty well-maintained block. If I go towards the West Florissant Inn, it's a pretty well-maintained block, but this block that sits in the middle causes all the problems, and it makes it harder for residents in that, uh, in that particular stretch who are elderly and over the age of 60. Now, on this particular block, uh, again, there's only four houses that are residential that people actually live in, and the rest are vacant. Uh, it's three vacant lots that sit along uh, Red Bud Avenue, and I am working comprehensively with SLDC to come up with a targeted plan and a more comprehensive plan uh, as far as Red Bud. But right now, we have to do something to market the area for a developer to come in. Right, so my, my next question was gonna be, if we do this, then how do people know? Because if this is just, uh, how would a developer know that this is an opportunity for them? Well, I think that falls on the shoulders of myself and the SLDC to uh, uh, continue to go out and search for developers who want to come into North St. Louis uh, and redevelop areas. Okay. Thanks. Um, Alder Woman Boyd is not present. Uh, Alderman Bosley, any questions? Uh, no questions. Uh, Alderman Oldenburg. Just real quick by a matter. I know we've, we've taken this strategy, and this may be a question for SLDC, John, um, of a larger square block of, of abatement. Do we have kind of a track record of this, this working when we do, as opposed to just an individual property or parcel? We take a larger a larger approach, and do we have kind of evidence of that working in other parts of, of the city? Well, I can't, I can't specifically say what areas we've done but, um, that have, have resulted in anything, but we can in this, and we haven't really talked to the aldermen about it, but we are beginning to put together RFPs for certain concentrated areas, and we could certainly do that and actually advertise this block. Uh, to developers and and put a blanket you know email out to all potential developers, and I think that might be a way to uh, to try and market a block like this. Sure. Yeah. Okay. No further questions. Yeah. 
Dale, if, if you could, and I'm sorry, Alderman, I don't mean to ignore you, but I'm, no, no, I'm no thinking I might ask the question. Um, when we do this, can you explain how this might be different than a redevelopment plan, for example, of three, uh, 353, where, uh, you know, let's say that somebody comes in and just develops one, uh, who will kind of administer and kind of start the clock and stop the clock and so forth? Well, of course, this would authorize tax abatement for any individual parcel or for the entire area or several parcels in the area. So if we can get a developer that would come in and even just want to do one, either rehab or, or new construction, uh, they would come to us, they would submit a, a proposal, and if it's just a simple little like house to be built, we would simply then work with them and the design of it to make sure it works into the neighborhood and then uh, go through the, the process of, LCRA would go through the process of, of having so them. SLD, uh, in essence, your SLDC is administering. Yeah, the, the staff of SLDC area. on behalf of LCRA. Right. Okay, so you would sign parcel development agreements as opposed to... Uh, a 353 master developer would? Right, or if there was someone wants to come in and do the whole block, then we would enter into a redevelopment agreement with them for the okay. entire block or okay. a large portion of the block. You remember we have that sort of million dollar threshold, so if someone's doing small projects, building three houses at 200,000 each, uh, we wouldn't go through the process necessarily of, of uh, signing a redevelopment agreement, but if someone wanted to come in and build a, a number of houses, then we would go through the process of a redevelopment agreement and, and move ahead with it. But either way, whether it's an individual project or a more massive project, this would authorize us to uh, uh, implement a 10-year tax abatement for the, uh, the various houses that might get developed. Yeah, since the big, the big advantage is it would streamline it so that if something... Right, it's ready to go. Yeah. It's ready to go. And as we talked about before, we could put out an RFP and we might get some, some result of that. Um, Thank, okay. th thank you, Dale. Sure. May, may I say? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, this, Alderman Kennedy. Yeah, this, this kind of approach was, was, has not, it is not uncommon. And we did it in the 18th along North Sarah, which resulted in the development that we now see on North Sarah. It gives you the opportunity to, to market those particular parcels when you have these large stretches of vacant land and vacant buildings. And now it does require us, even as Alderman, to get out there and kind of pound the pavement and try to attract people there. but. If we hadn't have done it ahead, it certainly helped us, I'll put that, as it relates to the development on North Sarah. And I know it was also done in the 19th, because we shared that part of that development. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alderman. Th thank you, Alderman. Uh, any other questions of committee members? Uh, hearing or seeing none, hearing none, uh, the chair will entertain a motion that we pass out board bill number 142 with a due pass recommendation. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Alderman Kennedy? Aye. Alderman Boyd? Aye. Alderwoman Davis? Aye. Alderman Kotar? <clears throat> Alderman Ogilvy? Aye. Alderwoman Boyd? Alderman Bosley? Aye. Alderman Oldenburg? Aye. Chairman Rohde? Aye. President Reed? Aye. Eight aye votes do pass. I apologize. I didn't realize our president was joining us today. Um, didn't see you back here, Mr. President. Um, uh, Alderman, uh, you're recognized to proceed on board bill number 146. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, board bill 146 is a uh, tax abatement and redevelopment plan along Natural Bridge Avenue. Uh, this stretches between di three different neighborhoods uh, in our city, Penrose, O'Fallon, and Greaterville, uh, pretty much from Fair Avenue to Streve Avenue. And it's just... Uh, uh, offering 15-year tax abatement and just trying to market the area uh, for developers to come in uh, and develop as well. Do you have a cheat sheet on that as well, Alderman? I do. And Board Bill 146 does not include intimate domain uh, uh, neither. Thank you.
Uh, Alderman, what was the street that you said that was running through the center of this? This is Natural Bridge Avenue. Oh, from Natural Fair Bridge. So th that's what I was Avenue. guessing. I was thinking that it might be a more of a commercial approach than. Um, it's both. Natural Bridge is filled with commercial uh, uh, and residential uh, buildings. Great. Uh, Alderman, uh, well, let me start off now that we have the president with us. Mr. President, do you have any questions? No questions. Uh, Alderman Kennedy, any questions? No questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, Alderman Boyd, any questions? Um, Alderman, for some reason, I remember doing uh, Natural Bridge. Is this a, a second phase of tax abatement for Natural Bridge? No. Your ward? Uh, I've never offered uh, tax abatement on Natural Bridge. I don't know if any of my predecessors have, uh, so I cannot answer that question. Okay. I don't know why it seemed like we did, it came up before, which is certainly a great idea. Um, but M Mr. Chairman, I actually have a question for Otis Williams, since he's out in the audience in reference to um, these type of tax abatements. Good Sir. morning. Good morning. Otis, go ahead and tell everybody who you are, just to... Uh, Otis Williams, uh, SLDC. Okay, Otis, um, when we do these tax bill abatements as aldermen, and this is probably one of the most proactive tax abatement legislations when it covers a larger geography, which gives greater opportunities for development versus the scattered site in our neighborhoods, which we typically do when there's a developer just want to do one house here or a couple of houses there. How is SLDC helping us market these opportunities? And I bring that up because I did this with Arlington Grove, phase two, pretty much a couple years or so ago. Is there a mechanism, a process in place? Is it out on the website for developers? Is that something that we need to actively have conversation with you guys about? Do we have a system in place where it's promoted? I mean, how do we really get these um, opportunities moving? So a number of things. I think Dale uh, referred to the opportunity to do an RFP. So let me introduce uh, Matt Bauer, who is a new team member. He is uh, uh, he, he's replacing Brian Robinson, who was on our team. Uh, and Matt, if you stand, stand up, uh, Matt's past background is with development strategies, but we brought him on specifically to do RFPs and to do uh, some uh, coordinations with our folks in uh, commercial district planning. Um, uh, so we will be working with the Alderman and for uh, things like this, uh, this block and others where we have uh, Chapter 99 development areas, we will advertise them. But we are not currently doing that, is well, that correct? We do, but it's not as uh, de detailed as, you know, with all of our uh, things, we, they, they're posted, but it's just generally posted for the, because it's a process uh, procedure. Uh, but uh, we will uh, go both online and be more active uh, with the promotion of these. And when will you start that? Uh, well, we have a few of them out there already. So we initially, you, you may have seen some that we've done. We did it with uh, uh, in uh, the fourth ward. Uh, we've done it uh, with um, the Chuck Berry uh, facility. I, I can't name all of them. So we, we, we've done a few. Uh, we, ju we just released, released Commerce Bank, uh, which is at the corner of Newstead and uh, Natural Bridge. Okay. Uh, so uh, let me ask you this. In 30 days, for example, I can expect to see um, this particular um, tax abatement as well as the one we just passed for Board Bill 142 online, where a developer can go to the city, to your website, and see what opportunities exist. We, we will look at what we're doing to make sure everything is, is online. I think where we are on certain of these, where we want to have special attention, we will uh, market it greater than just putting it online. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering if it's helpful where all of them get special attention, where every um, tax abatement bill that's out there, you know, in in mass, you know, whereas aggregate, you know, lots or buildings is in one place for a developer. Um, because 
certainly I would like to see the one we did for the Wells Goodfellow neighborhood out there online and, and what options are available in the centers for developers as well as everything that we do. Um, it's something I've been talking about for quite some time as far as, you know, in North St. Louis specifically that we have to have a concerted effort to make sure that we're pushing developers in these opportunity areas. I don't think we've done a great job in the past because we're always reactive and we're understaffed. But it's just time that we really accelerate our marketing of these opportunities to really give our uh, struggling neighborhoods a, ch a chance to succeed. So I will be kind of on this looking forward to, you know, making sure that I can push it because there's a link, you know, to go to um, that has a toolkit of resources and incentives for different developers so that we can accelerate developing our community. Is that fair? Uh, Yes, I, you know, I, I to a degree. I think we are already doing s some of what you're suggesting, but I guess we need to make sure you know where all of these things are as well. So, yeah, I, I don't think the Orange and Grove is out there online. Am I mistaken? Uh, it was at one time, but uh, I'll, I'll check. All righty. Okay. I just want to make sure that we're doing our due diligence, and I sure. certainly appreciate uh, let, your work. Let us review what is online currently because things go up and, and come off and that kind of thing. So we'll, we'll take a look. But if for the most part, if it is a large area or a multiple um, uh, sites, we, we'll take a look at those to see uh, whether. So okay. Sometimes there's already a developer that's already designated, and so we don't need to um, right. uh, you know, advertise that. Uh, it's just a matter of that developer then doing his due diligence and getting it done. But if it's an area like what uh, the alderman is proposing, then we will work with you to put it online. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. No further questions. Thank you, Alderman. Um, Alderwoman Davis. No questions. Uh, Alderman Kotar. No questions. Uh, Alderman Ogilvie. Thanks. I, w I think I would just add for clarification, these bills don't actually abate anyone's taxes as is, of course. What these do is say the abatement potential is out there and it's easier to get than it would be otherwise because the area has already has the blight designation. So then all you have to do is go to SLDC and prove that you have done a project with enough investment and then your parcel can freeze its property taxes. We're not just saying this whole stretch today has frozen property taxes. I think that might not be just want to make that clear to anybody that might be listening, um, the, the distinction there. So, yeah, thank that, you. That's correct, Alderman. Thank you. Um, Alderman Boyd has not joined us. Um, Alderman Bosley, any questions? Uh, also, I do have a comment. Uh, for those who don't know, Natural Bridge is considered uh, one of the worst streets in the entire United States. Uh, I'm sorry, the worst street in the entire United States, unless it changed within the last year. Um, it is a really good idea uh, to incentivize this area because it is run down. It has this uh, property stricken. We've got crime everywhere. I have a stretch of it, and I'll be looking to kind of follow suit with my stretch of natural bridge. Uh, yeah, good job, John. Thank you, Alderman. Thank you, Alderman. Um, Alderman Oldenburg. <clears throat> no questions. Okay. Um, the Alderman from the 22nd wants to reconfirm. Um, excuse me, Alderman. I'm going to talk past you here for a second. And just uh, Dale, I mean, have you? Do you keep track of these development areas so that we're not, you know, double blighting them or something like that? Oh yeah, no, I don't think okay. that's a problem. So, uh, and this one, just I might comment, has uh, uh, in, in a, as following along with Alderman Ogilvie's, the, the other thing this has that Redbud doesn't particularly have is the ability for existing property owners to do substantial rehab to their property and getting tax abatement for it. So, because uh, there are, you know, obviously a lot of buildings in this stretch. So uh, it, it, it has that potential as well. Good. Uh, one other kind of comment along these lines. One of our, uh, one of the uh, uh, 
comments that was uh, made very frequently while we were studying incentive reform was the idea of, of beginning to uh, expand um, development throughout the city and um, while all of that's not going to be accomplished with incentive reform alone there are other components of it and I think particularly for this stretch of uh, natural bridge uh, an element of that will be the uh, kind of repurposing of the commercial district program so the commercial district program previously was uh, active in all 28 wards. I don't think they've quite rolled out what the plan is, but, but the thought would be is, is that instead of being active in 28 wards, we would kind of focus or concentrate those resources into some of the more distressed commercial strips that are outside the central corridor. So that would be uh, hopefully a, a program that could be paired with this to go ahead and, and uh, create some visibility for it. So. <clears throat> Um, if there are no other questions or comments on uh, this board bill, which is uh, 146, the chair will entertain a motion for due pass recommendation. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. We've had another committee member join us, so we need to take another call, roll call. Uh, Madam Chairman, please call the roll. Alderman Kennedy. Aye. Alderman Boyd. Aye. Alderwoman Davis. Aye. Alderman Kotar. Aye. Alderman Ogilvie. Aye. Alderwoman Boyd. Alderman Bosley? Aye. Alderman Oldenburg? Aye. Chairman Rohde? Aye. President Reed? Aye. Nine, I vote. Who passed? Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, the Alderwoman from the 20th has joined us. Uh, board Bill number 185, Alderwoman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the HUDS Committee. Um, I'm here today to discuss uh, board Bill 185, which is a simple tax abatement for 3420 California in the lovely Gravway Park neighborhood. And I have some handouts here to pass around. <clears throat> and, and I presume this is an occupied pro project as well? It is. It was not occupied when the, um, when the tax abatement process started. Um, Johnny Brower uh, has done a few properties in our neighborhood. He was the developer. Um, there was some sort of miscommunication last year with some staffing changes at SLDC that ended up erroneously putting this on the back burner. And so here we are a year later uh, making sure that this gets done for the homeowner, who, by the way, is in the room today. <clears throat> so this is, um, you know, again, an area um, you know, Gravway Park, which continues to have significant challenges, um, but is coming along quite nicely. This particular property is just a block off of, you know, on this first block off of Cherokee Street um, at California and Cherokee. And so um, it's a pretty simple 10-year um, tax abatement. Uh, this is, again, this is in a MVAF, so a really an area that needs some investment, uh, but certainly is worth the investment because as I mentioned, you know, as we all know, Cherokee Street is really coming along quite nicely. Great. Um, um, Mr. President, do you have any questions of the sponsor? Uh, no, no questions from the President. Uh, Alderman Kennedy, any questions? Oh, Alderman Kennedy stepped away. Okay. Uh, Alder no questions. No, Alderman Boyd has no questions. Um, Alderwoman Davis. No questions. Uh, Alderman Kotar. No questions. Uh, Alderman Ogilvy. Uh, when was the work actually completed? The work was completed uh, last year, sometime after the tax abatement process started. Um, again, there was a staffing error at SLDC, somebody who's no longer with us, but that sort of put it on the black burner, um, but it was sort of an oversight. Um, I don't know if Dale wants yeah. to speak on that. It was, it was first brought to the, uh, the application came in in the spring of 2016, and it was put on the LCRA agenda June of 2016. At that time, uh, our employee asked for it to be tabled. And after that, it's very unclear what happened after that, and I'm not quite sure why it was tabled. Uh, but it was, and uh, the, obviously the project continued. Uh, the developer sold the property, and the buyer thought the tax abatement was in place, and why, clearly why, it was not. Why would a buyer think that if there was no bill and LCRA never approved it? 
Well, I, I'm uh, assuming that the developer indicated to her that it, it was, and she is present. She can explain that to you if, you, if you'd like to hear that. And actually, I'll take the blame for that. Um, you know, I had spoken to the developer last year. Uh, I was supportive of the tax abatement. I do think this area deserves and needs some help um, in, in promoting development. We still have vacancies on this block. And working with the former employee, we were moving forward. And uh, when the ball got dropped, quite honestly, I just, um, didn't realize that we hadn't moved forward. It was one of those things that just sort of fell by the wayside. So um, we were all sort of under the impression this was moving forward and we, uh, it, it clearly was not. Um, so uh, I'll take the responsibility for that, not following up with SLDC on it. Um. Alderman Boyd is not present. Uh, Alderman Bosley, any questions? No, sir. Uh, Alderman Oldenburg? No question. Um, okay. See, oh, we do have uh, a speaker signed up for this board bill, um, uh, Kelly Hayes. Hi. I'm the homeowner. <laughs> um, when I bought the property, I was told I had an abatement. So I started calling and saying, where is this abatement? I kept getting the runaround. I have all my notes. And somebody told me, and I think his name is Michael, to call after the first year, which I did. And I got a hold of Dale eventually. And so that's why I'm here. Um, I made a big investment in the neighborhood financially. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm nervous. Um, and I just felt like, you know, I, I could have bought anywhere in the city. I'm from Fenton. We were in Rockwood School District. And I'm like, <clears throat> We were down here all the time, so I just decided to buy. But, you know, I mean, I think I should have the abatement at this point. Sorry, I'm so nervous. <laughs> Can I ask who the developer was? Uh, Noble uh, Restoration Bauer was the last name. Johnny Brower. He's done a, couple, a handful of projects in the south side area. So are we going to blacklist him for applying for future tax abatements because he lied to a buyer when he sold the property to her? Um, I have the form at home and it shows and it's got the abatement and check mark on it. So right. I, 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 will be I don't think just you didn't do anything wrong. Oh, I'm, right. not, I'm, I'm saying are there no consequences for a developer that lies to a buyer and says there's tax abatement when there's not? I will uh, follow up with this and make sure that this doesn't happen again. You know, Mr. Brower has been investing in the community for over a decade and then, you know, starting at a time when it was really a challenge, a chilly challenge. So um, I, I can really appreciate some of the work he's done, but I'll be happy to follow up and make sure this doesn't happen again. Um, are, are there any other questions? Uh, the Alderman from the 22nd. Miss Kelly, right? Yes. Good morning. First Good of all, morning. thank you for... Uh, you. moving from Fenton and, uh -huh. and investing in the city of St. Louis. You know, and I do, and I will tell you one thing. The first couple of months, I, I was near tears. I thought I made a huge, huge mistake. The more I've been there, I walk up and down the street. I spend my money on the street. I try to ingrain myself in the neighborhood. And uh, so now I love it. So. Just curious question. Did you use a real estate agent when you... I actually, uh, on my phone, because we were looking for the house, mine sold so quickly in Fenton, I had a bunch of neighborhoods dinged. That house popped up on Friday night, and so I called Saturday morning at 9, and I said, I'm in a rest. And he goes, well, we've had several calls. We're opening at noon. We went down, walked in, bought it. I mean, it was just... So you bought it right from the developer. You didn't go well, to the real estate I, I agent. actually called Tyler Olson because I, the real estate agent, as right. a real estate agent, because I was just not real sure about the street, right. and I felt like it's worth a few thousand dollars to pay him just to make sure I'm in a decent area where, you know, he thinks that it's a good investment. So, so he represented you? He did. Okay. The reason I'm asking that, because I wanna, I'm just trying to close the loop on, you know, where we fall short and how we can do better. Mm -hmm. So as the real estate agent, I would have thought it would be his responsibility to make sure that it actually had tax abatement so that we could have caught it and, a lot. Earlier. And they actually used Sir, I, I don't know how you pronounce it, Sierra Properties was the actual people. Circa, Circa thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, so they were the ones that were actually selling the property. So when I called Tyler, he just kind of stepped in and did a little paperwork for me. Okay. 
it, it, all the women, okay. this has happened before. It, it's not like it's the very first time. It's unfortunate, but it, it is the developer's responsibility okay. to follow through on it. It shouldn't be on us as an alderman. It shouldn't be on, on the buyer. Um, it's unfortunate when it happens, but I'm on the, of the mindset of the autumn of the 24th. I mean, if, if it starts to happen consistently with a developer or it happens a second time after we've done it one time, then um, maybe that developer should seek different Yes, I, 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 could, I wholeheartedly agree, and I will point him not only to this uh, hearing here and make sure that he knows that this is a, a, an issue that we're all concerned about, uh, but uh, make sure that this, I will make sure this doesn't happen again. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank Again, you. Ms. Kelly, appreciate it. No other questions? The chair will entertain a motion on the so move. Second. Second. Previous roll. Okay. Uh, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Alderman Kennedy. Alderman Boyd. Aye. Alderman Davis. Alderman Kotar. Aye. Alderman Ogilvie. No. Alderman Boyd. I'm sorry, all the woman boy. Alderman Bosley? Aye. Alderman Oldenburg? Aye. Chairman Rohde? Aye. President Reed? Aye. Seven I votes, one no vote. Okay. Okay. Uh, board Bill 185 passes out of committee with due pass recommendation. The uh, next board bill before us is board bill number 101. Alderman from the 15th, you're recognized. Proceed, Oliver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board for coming out this morning. Um, board Bill 101 um, is uh, basically a 26-unit uh, mixed-use apartment building um, for Morgan Ford, which is a uh, I would say up-and-coming business district for our area. It's it's not South Grand yet, but our you know our hope is is someday it it will be. Um, how did we get to this project? Um, about three years ago, we started something um, with the help of our community development corporation to create a neighborhood framework envisioning plan. Um, and basically this plan for us outlined what development should look like for our community. We did a number of public engagement sessions over about um, a year period, got feedback from um, nearly a thousand residents and put that into a plan that um, that really laid out what um, what folks were looking for. And a couple of the key things that stuck out was uh, maintaining housing diversity and supporting the development of high quality uh, housing that is dense um, to enhance the residential market of the neighborhood. Um, what it also talked about is needing to uh, connect Morgan Ford to the rest of uh, the rest of the neighborhood and the rest of the city um, to create more north-south connectivity along that area, um, continue some of the improvements in the revitalized core, and um, and uh, and and implement housing models to 
uh, combat some of the de-densification that was happening in our neighborhood. So we don't have a, a, a very high vacancy rate. What we have had over the last five years is a loss of 354 rental units because of conversions from single family home, uh, from two family flats or four families into single families. And so we've lost a, a you know, both affordable housing and market rate housing uh, over the last five years um, because of all of those conversions. And we're seeing those continue, and so now we're at this point as a community to figure out, okay, well, how do we, if we want a diversity of housing, um, how do we uh, support housing in a way that creates both, um, that allows for rental housing to to continue in our neighborhood when we are having so many of these conversions. Um, so about a year ago, uh, Rob Maltby came to myself and our neighborhood organizations and our business district and said, um, you know, I'm interested in this car wash site. Uh, we've had a lot of problems with the car wash over the years. We've had people who have overdosed in the vestibules. We have had uh, chronic problems with uh, illegal dumping. We've had an absentee landlord for the car wash that pretty much does not pick up calls and doesn't really respond to city requests or city fines to take care of the, the property. And a lot of folks are pretty frustrated over that. So when he came to us um, and asked us, you know, about this type of project, basically what we said is, okay, well, let's first look at this compared to the plan that our community had put together to see does this fit within it. And, um, and we, we recognized that it checked off a lot of boxes. But the concern that a lot of folks have was with the abatement and if they would need an abatement. And at the time when the developer came to us, he, um, he was trying to do the project without any kind of tax incentive. Um, but once he started trying to get financing, what he found is he couldn't get financing and, uh, and was turned down from several banks. And we're at a place right now where um, he cannot close on a loan in order to move this project forward unless there is an abatement approved on it. And so when we had the initial conversations with our, uh, our development organization, with our business association, um, with our, our neighborhood leaders, um, basically what they, they said is, okay, if you end up needing an abatement, then what we want to require from you as a community is something called a community benefit agreement. And that's not something that's specifically tied to this bill, but it was something that our community demanded um, in order to support this project. And so they went through a pretty uh, substantial process. Um, and I will say that Rob has been a tremendous sport through a lot of this and getting a lot of um, you know, heat thrown at him, getting, having a lot of uh, constituents that have a ton of questions and he has been really quite amazing in answering that. Um, and so through the end of that process, ended up uh, reaching an agreement that both the business district agreed with um, and our neighborhood association uh, agreed with. And I will pass out, I have those letters of support. Two different ones, yes. Um, so that is, um, you know, and I'm happy to bring up Rob to talk a little bit more um, specifically about the project and some of the work that he's went through and the reason um, he's kind of at the place that he is today. Um, thank you, Chairman and members of the committee. I do have some handouts here for the project renderings themselves. So, no. <laughs> um, so, so for me, this project has been been a really interesting one to work on. Um, I've actually lived in the 15th Ward for the last seven years myself, and uh, moved there primarily, as funny as it sounds, um, to be close to the Amsterdam Tavern so I could get up on Saturday and Sunday morning and watch soccer as a transplant from London. So um, I've been somewhat involved, invested in the neighborhood, um, watching soccer at Amsterdam for a number of years now. And that car wash being directly across the, the street has always been something that has caught my eye as sort of a, a very underutilized site in the neighborhood that could provide higher density for residential um, uh, 
re well, for residents living in the neighborhood based on what Megan has uh, alluded to uh, briefly, but also um, a place that could help kind of promote continued business growth within the neighborhood um, from linear commercial street front um, development. So I had the opportunity with my two business partners, I guess in October of last year, to um, move forward and purchase that car wash site um, with the intent to put something on there that was hopefully better than the car wash site and working with various stakeholders, um, our architect Gemma, who, who are here today as well, um, and Older Woman Green and the neighborhood committee as well as the business uh, committee and association to come up with something that we think uh, helps uh, fit the scale and size of the Morgan Ford business district, but also to help um, bring some of the density, a much needed sort of, uh, in, in my opinion, um, contemporary development to um, sort of juxtapose what we have in this really cool um, yeah. mix of old and new that already exists on Morgan Ford. Um, as a resident of the neighborhood, you know, I'm, I'm certainly invested in how this project develops, um, and I, you know, as, as a, someone that lives there and someone that walks up to Morgan Ford uh, a lot to see this district kind of grow and thrive is something that I think is, is something I'm very passionate about. Um, I, I was fortunate enough to grow up in a city that had development happening um, so rampantly and sort of unchecked that um, just walkable neighborhoods, uh, people on the street and businesses was something that uh, was just sort of a given and an axiom of, of me growing up. And then to come to St. Louis and to have this uh, potential in a neighborhood that has been unrealized has been really exciting for me as someone that could have never, ever, ever, ever in a million years done a project like this in London. Um, so I, I'm really excited personally um, because I think we are so close to having the first new construction building within the neighborhood um, for uh, market rate residential uh, in, the, in the last two 20 years, two decades, um, and I think that's uh, really exciting for me personally to be a part of, um, and, and we are hoping that we can we can move forward. Um, we are very close to hopefully moving forward pending this the next few meetings, um, and we've had numerous conversations with banks. I think we've, we're on our fourth bank, and the challenge we did have was just getting the return on investment, not only on the debt side from the bank, but also for our equity partners. Uh, unfortunately, I am not um, of the means to support and finance this project myself, um, but we do have to incentivize others to invest in this project, and so far, um, based on our pro forma projections inclusive of a tax abatement, um, we have been able to secure pending uh, an abatement, the, uh, the equity and the debt components that has taken um, a little bit longer, obviously, with all the concurrent meetings that we've had to, to move forward. Um, Robert, welcome to St. Louis. My, my son is actually in London, attending the London School oh. of Economics now, is living, nearing, living near Paddington Station. Oh. So he's, uh, he's adv I get weekly updates on the vibe. <laughs> the uh, exciting and uh, vibrant street life in, mm -hmm. in London as I, he walks to, I don't know which station it is, but he's, he takes, uh, takes the tube every day to, to the LSE. Um, could you tell us a little bit, how long have you been working on the project and how much you've invested in it? So we've been working on the project um, sort of in, since its inclination, since I believe I reached out to Megan of October of last year. Um, and that was our first meeting when we had the opportunity to buy the, the land itself. We closed on the property in February and then we started to really sort of ramp up the what are we going to do with the site and who who would be a really good team to, to put in place. So um, we reached out to John Mueller and John McKee at Gemma Architects in Midtown trying to keep as much of our business city based as possible. Um, so a number of our uh, design firms have been located within the city too. Um, and then um, we, we started to meet with various stakeholders with the neighborhood uh, association uh, with the business association I believe uh, Bill is here representing 
joining them today, and then also Megan um, herself to, to try and figure out what the highest and best use of the site was. So as a resident of the neighborhood, I had no intention of doing this project without um, community involvement and community stakeholders having a say. Uh, I, I do believe that um, it's sort of paramount to get a project done that benefits everyone in the neighborhood, um, and, and we have had a, a somewhat of a, a perhaps drawn out process on this, but it was honestly because I was open to doing that as well. Um, as someone that has seen some developments in the city sort of go unchecked in, in the past. So you've uh, you've spent about a year on this at this point. Yes. I, I yep. presume that you've got quite a bit of expenditure in your pre-development costs? Yes, ab correct? absolutely. Um, so I, I don't have a, a total number, but it's it's well over six figures right now. Um, so pending an abatement, obviously, we'll, we will be able to pay for our professional. Uh, we'll close on financing and, and start moving forward, but paying for those upfront professional services, so the structural and civil design work, the architecture, the legal fees, et cetera, to move forward, and not, you know, notwithstanding a, a large sum of money, which um, we've currently been paying out of pocket. Um, I, usually at this point, we ask the uh, uh, Mr. Ferry from SLDC to step up and go through the financials with us, and then we can start going through the committee at that point. Then, um, Mr. Ferry. Good morning, members of the board, uh, committee. Um, yes, so um, I believe uh, you guys have the latest uh, version that was handed out. Um, we had a it wasn't updated recently, but the copy that was mailed out was uh, an old one. So uh, hopefully you guys have the zip in. Dale, zip in. Yeah, they do. Okay. So I'm just going to start on the first page here. Um, this is the latest version of the, well, actually it's not the latest, latest version because we've changed the scoring on the stars to uh, decimals because the fractions were confusing, but this still has the fractions on the second page. But um, anyway, we'll just start with the narrative here. So um, uh, obviously this stuff that's already been said, this is 26 unit residential building with about 6,400 square feet of retail. Um, it'll provide six full-time and 13 part-time jobs. Um, and that's the anticipated number. About 13 of those are considered entry level. Um, you see the average salary for each of those job types. Full-time is just under 44,000 and the part-time jobs are uh, 135. Um, it's uh, MVA Class D and the uh, um, Neighborhood Commercial um, Strategic Land Use Area. Uh, the 10-year tax abatement is valued at $634,000 and change um, over 10 years. Uh, total project cost is about $6.6 .6 million. Um, net revenue to the city over the first 10 years, uh, full years of the project life is $261,000. Uh, new revenue to the school district is about fourteen five. So I'm I have a totally different version. If just okay, um, so none the of one that was handed out should be. Uh, I thought this is the one that was just handed out. <coughs> why? Why are the numbers that you're reading different from the numbers on the actual financial incentive report? Which one are you looking at? Which number? Right, you wanna Okay, so there's another page I'm looking at. It's um, it's this one. So these numbers. Mr. Chairman, to be clear, are we supposed to be looking at the version that is included in this packet that starts with this front page, Board Bill 101? I'm not sure. Because I've got multiple versions of this. Okay. Uh, the one that that I'm looking at was handed out separately. It doesn't have uh, the other information, so it does not have this cover page on it. The first page looks like this. Looks like what? It just says, um, here. There were, they all handed like 10 copies out this morning, I believe, that were made, but I um, apologize for that. Uh, 
I mean, I've got well, versions from the packet here that wildly differ from. I don't know which one of these. And then I got an email. Yeah, that printed them right. Myself, and that's what so I don't they know which one. Have. Why I'm not sure. I this is the, I have this to admit I was kind of zoning out for a second. So. Can you show him? Can you show him that I was reading from? He was looking at the value of the 634. Okay. Uh, Zach is doing it. Okay. Okay. So. And if page, no page number is in that package. One oh one, board bill one oh one on it. Okay, so this is this is this was passed out just moments ago. Oh, so, yes. Okay, so this right here. And he's inside there on this these page. Are, these are the numbers he was reading. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, he's just rounding them up. Yeah, no, I'm all right. But I was saying this and what is on the other side don't seem to be this is the packet it's 261 and he's rounding up the numbers but it's just right here what he was reading that's inside the packet there it uh, no there it is right there And this is the page he's reading from right. this side right, right there, but he was rounding up those numbers. Understanding the numbers Okay. Are we ready to? Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I just want to make sure I yeah, so anything. just to clarify for everyone else's benefit, um, so I'm looking at this page that says uh, 3172 Morgan Ford Narrative Summary Report, and there's a second page, um, which is the Financial Impact Report, and the numbers all line up. It's just, um, I had, uh, so I can clarify where, th so this is taking numbers from both the Financial Impact Report, and it's also taking numbers from the uh, the Tax Summary Report, which is the one that looks like like this, that. So, um, and it's putting them all together in a like in a narrative summary format. Basically, that six hundred thirty-four thousand that is the total uh, value of the tax abatement over ten years to all the taxing bodies. Um, the number when you look at the the financial impact report, that's looking more directly at just what is the impact to the city itself. So, it says the city portion of the incentive is one hundred and sixty-three thousand and change. Um, but anyway, the um, uh, so where we were left at, left off at, uh, this, those numbers on the, uh, the again on that narrative summary report where it says 261,000, uh, that's the net revenue to the city. You'll see that on the second page um, under that first box that says 10-year revenues to the city. It says net new revenue to the city, 261,000. That's after you take the uh, the gross revenue, subtract off the incentive amount from the city, subtract off the uh, revenue loss to substitution effect. You get the net revenue to the city of 304,000 and change. Um, then you have the baseline revenue, what the city would expect if there was no project, which is 43,000, which leaves net new revenue to the city of 261,000. Um, so anyway, so we'll go to that second page now because that pretty much completes the first one. So here, I'm here now. Um, one of the things that is important to note is that this project, if you look at the, uh, the rate of return, is, um, is relatively thin. The normal range of uh, rates of return that the market would expect um, for a project like this um, is between 5.6 and 9.7%. Without incentive, this is at 5.4, and with, um, it gets up to 5.8, so it just just barely gets above the low end of the range there. 
Um, so that's uh, that's just validation for the story that he's telling you about the banks saying that they won't do it without the uh, the tax abatement. Um, this is a, a uh, as we would expect, this passes the but for test. Without the incentive, there would be no project. Um, so again, we kind of went over the, the first box, the 10 year revenues. You can see what the net revenues are to the city. Um, when you expand that out over 30 years, um, the amount of revenue that'll come into the city from this project is estimated at one and a half million dollars. Um, the average commercial property in the city on average would generate about 1.1 million. Um, the average commercial property in this neighborhood, on the other hand, would generate about 660,000, 659, 786 over a 30 year period. So you can see that the city's rate of return or return on investment is, um, is substantially positive. It's over 134% return um, uh, looking at the neighborhood average. That's that opportunity cost and it's, um, it's about a 39.7% uh, return compared to the average. So again, to very briefly explain what I'm looking at there, that opportunity cost or investment or that average commercial cost, that is um, how much tax revenue basically is applied to um, that we collect and that we need to collect in order to support all of our expenses. That's how much is applied to the average commercial property of this particular size. So it's based on the land size. Um, it's uh, per square foot of land area. So we take take the average for, um, for all commercial property in the city, multiply it by the land size, that and then over 30 years, that gives me that 1.1 million. Again, I do something very similar to that, just instead of looking at all properties in the city, condensing it down to just similar properties in the neighborhood. Um, but, but that's, it's not strictly just how much revenue is the city um, get on average from a property like this. It's actually a measure of how much revenue does the city need to get from a piece of property like this. Um, and it compares both the neighborhood and the city average. The, so the neighborhood is below city average uh, in large part because the average for the city is um, is given a very large boost by the central corridor. Um, about 55% of all of our revenue comes in from special mixed use land area within the uh, central corridor, basically between downtown and central west end. Um, so those areas are way above the, the average, whereas pretty much the rest of the city is below it. When you take those numbers and throw it into our, uh, our score model, essentially it gets 39.7 out of 40 points, so it's almost a perfect score. It's four and um, uh, I, don't, I don't have like decimals, so it's basically you're either four and three quarters or you're five, you have to get a perfect score to get five basically. So it's four and three quarters out of five stars, but essentially it's it's almost a perfect score. Um, there's no TIF, so that bottom box doesn't really ap uh, apply. Um, you can see the, uh, the financing uh, sources and uses on the right. Um, the percentage of public to private investment is 10%. I think it's actually like 9.7, um, but it's, it's rounded there. Um, you see the substitution effect rates that I used. Uh, I used 33% on the retail sales and 83% um, uh, on the residential earnings taxes. And then uh, finally, there's the break even year. Basically what I do is I look at the cost the city will incur f for maintaining a piece of property like this. Um, and compared to how much revenue is going to come in, essentially the, the property, even with the tax abatement, will be generating enough revenue from basically the very first year to be um, financially viable or sustainable to the city. So it's a, it's a good project to the city financially. Uh, the last page of the report, well, second to last page of the report is just this graph. It just simply, do you have the graph? I think it was included. It just simply shows the, uh, the revenues. So that yellow column, the yellow bars, are the, uh, the gross revenue per year coming from the project to the city. The, um, the green is the incentive value, and then the blue is what's left over. And then it compares, if you can see that top line that goes all the way across the page from left to right, that is sort of the, the line in the sand, if you will, of how much um, we need this property to generate uh, according to our estimates. And then the last, last page is um, the uh, fiscal impact of tax abatement. So this is to all the taxing entities. It just shows the... Um, 
the nominal abatement value um, in the first year, um, the average annual abatement value, or no, I take that back, it's the nominal abatement value uh, over the entire life, it's the average annual abatement value over the first five years, and then it's the revenue collected during the abatement period to each of the taxing districts. Um, so you can see, uh, see that information there. So this project's gonna generate about $90,000 uh, to the school district, for example, uh, over that time period. The reason that's different from before is because the other one is looking at um, net new and subtracts out substitution and everything else. This is just a nominal number. But um, that's it for the report. If you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Um, why don't we kind of go and order here and see. Um, we have people who have signed up to speak and uh, we will provide an opportunity of everyone uh, to do that who's here. We have, it looks like, um, about six or seven or eight speakers perhaps. So we, uh, we will be providing opportunity, usually depending on how long we're here, that would probably be about three minutes each or so. Uh, but prior to doing that, just so that the committee members have a, a clear understanding of the project, we'd like to go through and provide them an opportunity to ask questions. And so uh, at this point, um, uh, Mr. President? Is he, is he, uh, I just have one question uh, now. So when was the building Um, we acquired the building in, I believe it was February of uh, 2017. Uh, and when was your first engagement with the Business Association, Neighborhood Association, so and so forth? Um, we'd actually met with Megan and a few representatives of um, the Neighborhood Association and Business Association prior to that in late 2016, I believe. It was December of 2016. Same yeah. when you were purchasing it? Correct, yep. Okay. Um, and I, I don't believe at that time we actually had it under contract. I think we were still negotiating. Okay, thanks. No further questions right now, but I do okay. have some. Later. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Alderman Kennedy. I stepped out. Um, <laughs> Alderman Boyd. Sure, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. This looks like a pretty high-end uh, endeavor. Uh, so it's a great looking project. Curious question, just kind of, I don't know the area as well, if it was the Alderman, of course, but when I Googled it, it looked like the buildings around it are pretty much two-story buildings. So it's a mix on Morgan Ford, it's a mixture of two and three story. It is three? Yes, okay. there's a building on the corner opposite um, our site that is three stories. And so working with the architects to design this building, um, we try to re replicate sort of the sort of undulating uh, massing of the, of the buildings along the street going no higher than three stories. Yeah, it's a beautiful building. And then f from the inside projected pictures, it really looks nice. I, what stuck out for me as far as rent, so $1,000 for a one bedroom, 683 square feet, is that right, 1,050 so projected? Up, uh, I believe our average rents per square foot are hovering right around $1, um, $1.55 and, and a little bit lower. We have um, been working with our architects and we've sort of shrunk some of the interior non-rentable space to increase some of the square footages of the units. So the two bedrooms um, will be about 990 uh, square feet and our smallest one bedrooms will be about 600 square feet with some other one bedrooms being closer to 750 to 800 square feet, depending on where you are in the building. Um, we've, we've had a lot of pushback on, on rents per square foot and in doing this process and working with community stakeholders like the Neighborhood Association, the Business Association, and Older Woman Green, um, through the CBA process, we are in agreement to provide some funding back if, assuming we're moving forward with the project and the abatement that should help leverage um, a nonprofit development organization to contribute funding to purchase and hopefully retain a similar number of affordable units within the 15th ward um, to offset the 26 market rate units that we will be providing to. 
So your rents are so, going from so, yeah. basically 1,050 up to 1,500. We do have range. some units, yes, in the building that will be um, about 800, 850 uh, based on uh, the square footages. And some that will be 1,500. Right, for the two bedrooms. Mm -hmm. And every unit that we have has uh, exterior balcony space, regardless of where you are in the building. That was one of the challenges we had with a very sort of rectangular site, is how do you make it look cool mm -hmm. and have uh, exterior space without having some units offer better amenities for the same cost. Um, and so those are not actually included within our unit square footages because they are on the exterior, but um, they will add about, you know, between 60 and in some cases about 100 square foot of extra space to residents within the, uh, within the building without increasing that rent per square foot. Okay. And it's going to be two commercial units. Um, right now, we're in negotiations with uh, two users. Um, we, depending on how much square footage they need, we may have a third space. And with that, we have been trying to attract um, sort of hopefully a credit union or a banking center because the neighborhood is somewhat underserved for, you know, uh, neighborhood scale financial services. Um, and then maybe a, a sort of a health user or a, a, a restaurant at this time. Okay. I've uh, Alderwoman, <clears throat> talk a little bit about um, the community benefit agreement and I guess rent offsets. You know, how do you see that working in the neighborhood? So what we, we looked at a couple of different models. We looked at inclusionary zoning um, and we looked at kind of creating a housing fund and which could actually yield more affordable housing for the neighborhood. Um, hearing the pushback, you know, initially on the rent levels is why Rob kind of went back to the drawing board and figured out how he could get in some rental units that were, you know, closer to the eight, 850, which is um, pretty, the pretty normal, I guess, rent area for, for the ward right now. Um, what we ended up figuring out after working with um, some folks from uh, community development, our community development corporation, and with um, some folks who actually work in community development with U.S. Bank, um, as well as SLDC, was that if we created a fund um, and then put out an RFP to a nonprofit to say, you know, here's $60,000 and we want you to use this to leverage to create as much affordable housing in our neighborhood as you can, uh, what can you do with that? And so the feedback we got from kind of the experts in the field is they thought that we could create um, somewhere between between 20 and 24 units of affordable uh, by doing either by doing down payments on four families um, that are within that you know close proximity to the the project, and then those four families would be kept at uh, 50 per 30 to 50 percent of area and median income in perpetuity. So not until this passes will um, the entities that sign the community benefit agreement then put out the RFP um, and figure out who is the nonprofit that is going to manage those funds. Um, you know, based upon the, the things that the negotiation group was looking for. Can I, can I okay. Sure. So, sorry, just, just to add very quickly. So throughout this process, we've been trying to engage the, the public at large. Um, we did have, and Megan didn't allude to this, um, we did have a survey that we had members of our CBA committee go out and essentially get feedback from residents of the neighborhood on what was the top priority should we move forward with a CBA and an ultimate abatement. And affordable housing was the number one issue that came up versus beautification or bike lanes and streetscape improvements. So then we sort of listened and then we re reworked up, up agreement and ultimately um, floor plans for the building to try and incorporate as much of that as we can with what we could do um, with the resources we had. So let me ask you this. So are there certain units inside this new building that will be set aside for affordable housing? So because our footprint is relatively small, we th that was initially discussed and we try to reconfigure it so that everything could have been, you know, similar units with, with affordable um, units inside. And then obviously because our margins for debt um, from a bank and also the investors started to change, um, it was tough to get financing. So we kind of came to the conclusion that by being able to create a housing fund for affordable housing within the proximity of our building, um, we would be able to add actually rather than three to four 
units set aside for affordable housing, leverage that um, money um, to hopefully provide between 15 and 25 affordable units within the neighborhood, which I think most people within this committee agreed was a better use of, of money. Let me ask you this. So in your mind, a one bedroom, what would be the dollar amount or the rental amount for a one bedroom affordable unit in your mind? In my mind, uh, it depends on how you look at it from the sort of area median income. But within, I, th I believe, based on HUD guidelines, it's right around 550 to 600. Okay, thank you. So, Alderman, let me ask you this. <clears throat> you were saying that you would hope this fund, about $60,000, would support 20 to 24 affordable units. Is that correct? Yeah. And um, would this be home ownership or rental? This is rental. Um, again, because what I said earlier is we've lost 354 rental units um, in the ward in the last five years because we've had so many conversions from two family homes to single f or two family flats that mm -hmm. were rental to single family homes and four families that were rentals to two townhouses. And, um, and like I said before, we've lost both market rate and affordable because of that process. And so we're trying to figure out how do we, how do we add both, so that we don't become a neighborhood that's just single-family homes. So, so, are you thinking about creating a, a, a new building that has 20 to 24 affordable units, like with low-income housing tax credits or something, and you would leverage $60,000? What is your thought? Or what is the community's thought about? Um, so the, I think most are, are thinking that it would go toward. Um, putting down payment on a number of four families that we already have rather than building something new. Um, but again, when, when the RFP goes out um, after this is uh, approved, mm -hmm. then, um, you know, in that RFP, and I know the committee is working on it right now, um, they're asking for, you know, at wh whichever nonprofit gets this money, give us a proposal for what you can do to create the most number of affordable units in our community. And so if that means leveraging other um, things like low income tax credits to do something new, um, and we find out that that gets us more than the things that we had talked about with kind of the experts around our table, then I think that's the direction I would, I can't speak for you know the groups that signed the community benefit agreement, but I would think that that's the direction that they would go. I think I'm getting a little confused, and maybe it's based on terminology. What I heard you say was down payment assistance. In my world, that means <clears throat> you're a purchasing for home ownership, and you need down payment assistance. I think what I'm saying is down, so that nonprofit would take that 60000 and maybe put 15000 down on a four-family building, okay. and then they would rent that out, and all of the rents in that building would be kept at 50% or less of AMI and perpetuity. Okay. Um, and they would repeat that process for, you know, as many buildings as they're able to purchase. Okay. Kind of within the, the census tract that's around the, the <laughs> building, right. the new building. And my other comment is more trivial. You, you, you gave us some, I guess, support letters from the Board of Tower Grove Business Association and Tower Grove South Neighborhood Association. Neither one of them have signatures on them <laughs> to, to really validate they emailed them, so. anything. Uh, just thought I'd point that out. Thank you. I, mean, I, I could have. Bill is it. here, so he brought the letters. He didn't <laughs> sign it. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. No further questions. Uh, Alderwoman Davis. Uh, I'm extremely confused, and I. Because in the world of development, most especially in the real world of real estate, uh, $60,000 accomplishes very little. And so even if a nonprofit were to find a four family flat or something that they would purchase, first of all, the building is not working and uh, move in ready. Uh, it is not going to have many of the things that are required to start renting a piece of property. And so I'm not sure how this 15000 is going to help. Um, if anything, it will bring frustration to people who are assuming that they're going to receive something that is quite adequate from having $60,000. And I just want to put a little reality to it, that's all. 
So I'll just say that we have a community development corporation right now, the Tower Grove South Community Development Corporation, and they do this all the time. Um, and they helped advise us on what they thought we could do based upon the past projects that they've done in the ward. And so they have a portfolio right now of about 60 affordable units uh, in the neighborhood, and they're they're trying to grow that as much as possible. And um, in the numbers we got that said, you know, we probably need 15,000 to put down um, is a good down payment for them to be, for an organization like them to be able to purchase these properties um, and then do, you know, some of the, the, you know, upkeep, some of the maintenance work or whatever needs to happen on them. Um, they've assured us that, that they think that's an adequate number to be able to, to do the work based upon past projects in our ward. Is the, a representative from that organization here? No, not today. I would really like to hear uh, directly from them because it is extremely difficult. Uh, and even though they have 60 units, uh, I would really like to hear a little bit more about their process because that's interesting that uh, they believe that they can bring a total of 24 units or more uh, to bear with $60,000. I'm sure that Sean Spencer would love to, to meet with you at, at any time about you know what they do with, with Tower Grove South uh, Community or Tower Grove Neighborhood Community Development Corporation and and how they're able to kind of help replenish some of our affordable housing stock. Okay, and then um, this this most of your conversation has been about affordable affordable housing, and so I'm really curious why your minds couldn't come together and you develop an affordable project. So um, we, when we sat down at the table um, and kind of had a meeting about what we wanted to do um, with the project and create something that looked uh, really, really pretty neat, it, um, we'd always gone with the route of just building apartments, period. Um, when we started to run the numbers financially, it really came down to if this building is going to come out of the ground and become a reality, how do we convince a bank or how do we convince our investors to, to lend us money and, and subsequently invest in the project? Um, from a timing standpoint, and this is, uh, I mean, this is how we're in sort of a, a time crunch currently, um, when we closed on the property, knowing that to go through um, the channels to get a building designed finance and underwritten for affordable housing combined with our carry cost and upfront soft cost fees on the on the project um, it, it, it wasn't feasible but that being said with a building footprint of this size the ability to create an offset 26 market rate units with hopefully an equal number of affordable housing um, the stakeholders involved thought that that was a really good way to keep and retain kind of the existing character of the neighborhood by providing you know 300 um, 26 market rate units and also promoting affordable housing within existing buildings within the neighborhood so in my my day-to-day -day job I work as a real estate agent mm -hmm. and um, primarily in the city of St. Louis and over the last two years um, Tower Grove South or the 15th Ward has seen year over year increases in single family property values by about 6% in 2015 and in 2016 an 11% jump as the economy has gotten better. And what we've seen happen and, and what I've seen happen personally is a lot of um, these existing rental houses have, or l rental two families or four families have been bought by all cash investors who are then going in, flipping them and turning them into single families. So um, over the last couple of years, as Megan, uh, old woman Green, alluded to, we have lost over 300 units of, of rental housing, and um, a lot of that was market rate. Um, what we felt was we we had an, kind of an outmoded and outdated product, and um, I also sort of somewhat selfishly really thought a cool contemporary project would be a good fit for Morgan Ford because it isn't in a historic district. Um, so we were able to work with everyone involved to try and come up with what we thought was the highest and best use for this site to attract uh, commercial tenants on the ground floor residents to the neighborhood or hopefully new residents to the neighborhood but also provide some kind of um, funding for the promotion of existing and, and future affordable housing within the, within the neighborhood. Well, 
banks do lend money for affordable housing. Yes. As a matter of fact, they love those projects. Um, and then, you know, if, if, you, if you think about it, if the area is transitioning, which is what you're taking advantage of, because the area is transitioning to market rate, um, I still wonder what the future is going to be for those affordable units that you're talking about. But I wanted to go back and uh, ask another question, too, for the part of confusion that I had on this. When you, um, when you talked about you were going back looking at the numbers on your performa and you anticipate closing on financing once this is approved, um, there wasn't a lot of reality to that either because you cannot change a performer that drastically on the number of square feet and the rent without going from square one uh, with the financier. So um, that bothers me. That bothers me a lot. Do you have a direct question? I, I'm, I, I'm, really I'm just saying, to, I'm making yeah. a comment to so, you that that bothers me for, for the opportunity for this to succeed even after it's passed. The drastic numbers that you gave us saying that you were going back and redoing your performer on square footage and the amount of rent is troubling. Mm -hmm. we, we have And I'm saying that because I want to make sure CDA hears me say it because I need them to keep an eye on this very closely. So we, we have not, we've revised the floor plans. And not you said you were going to change the square feet. Of, That's what you said. Of the units themselves without impacting, hopefully, you know, nominally a dollar or two plus oh, or minus. You said the that the dollar feet. amounts would change as well for the rental of the units. If, yes, because we, we've included four or five smaller units that will be at a lower dollar value because if you have a, a buck fifty a foot and you go from a thousand square feet or fifteen hundred and it's now five hundred square feet, the rent would be seven fifty. So I, I mean, I, 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 I understand what you're saying, but I, I think our pro forma, and I think John can allude to, has remained the same throughout this process, but we have tweaked the number of uh, unit makeup as far as square footages without altering. So there is, a, there is a wider variety of square footages from the units themselves, where we have four 600 square foot units, and then uh, eight two bedroom 900 square foot units, but the gross square footage of the building hasn't changed because we're limited to the footprint of the building itself. I do I understand that, okay. but I also understand the workings of a performer, and I understand the square foot of each unit and the dollar amount and how it impacts the bottom line. And so when I look at this, and I don't see what you just said on this sheet, it bothers me, and it bothers me because you have to go back to the financier with those numbers to show it, and they have to approve it. Understood. That's why I'm just, I'm just saying. Correct. You know, I would have loved to have seen that on here. That would have been good. Sure, and, and right now, I mean, we, we have to go back to the bank with a, an answer of if this project is moving forward or not to close on financing. So we're still in the process of underwriting. So we'll, we'll have those conversations. Okay. Well, uh, as you said, this, was, this is new to you, right? Have you ever done a project before? Yes, I, I spent the last uh, 10 years in commercial development. Oh, you just, um, I didn't hear that earlier. Sorry, so I, I, I can allude to my background a little bit. Um, Thank I, you. I have a, a background in city planning um, and then ended up uh, opening the downtown bike station in 2009, um, right after I finished school, um, which was a sort of a nonprofit organization where you could ride your bike right. to work and then mm -hmm. hopefully, you know, there's a big shock retail store next to that. Subsequently, um, I then worked for Green Street Development for about four and a half years working with Brian Pratt and Phil Hulse, who have a pretty good track record of doing infill, reuse, and adaptive use projects within the city of St. Louis. Um, I helped uh, do all of our project management on the construction side as well as the green building component. So I helped oversee the lead certification of the Sheet Metal Workers Building, the Save Lot Grocery Store on Jefferson and uh, Lafayette, and the um, Urban Chestnut Brewery, among other kind of larger projects. And my last project before I left to work for myself is the um, 
sort of 270 unit, I believe it's called Chroma now, project down at Sarah Shoto in Vandevena. Um, so my, my background in commercial development is not just solely this project, it's been accumulating for the last few years. I just had the opportunity to, to do something within my own neighborhood that I was able to, to do on my own and not working for someone else, which I, I, I really like. <laughs> Okay, that explains that. That explains it, Dan. You know, when, <clears throat> when we're in large systems with great oversight, we tend to be more particular about what we present. But you're on your own, and so you thought it was okay to bring this this way, and then talk about it later. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm good. I'm good now. I'm real Thank good. You. So I don't. Uh, I really want to talk to this uh, organization because I don't like people being misled and. All of you all have heard me say this before. Uh, I don't like promises that can't be met. And I need to hear and see some things. Uh, even though this community benefit agreement has nothing to do with this bill, let's make that clear. Uh, we, don't, we don't like to propose out of this, or this body a lot of promises where people will come back and point their fingers at us and say, well, you supported it. You heard it, you said it was okay. Why didn't you look into it, okay? So that's real important to me, extremely important. Uh, and I wanna, uh, you know, and when we talk about a, affordable housing and affordable units and uh, everybody wants to use these buzzwords, but they've never actively done anything. They don't really know the true facts about the city of St. Louis. They don't know how many affordable units are available in the city of St. Louis, nor do they know or understand all of the resources that are out here to make it happen. And so uh, if your number one is you want affordable units, then do an affordable project. That's my thing. I think where we're talking past each other is it's an and, it's not an or. That the neighborhood wants and needs both market rate and affordable. And so it was trying to figure out how to use this project to be able to accomplish both. Right. And, uh, and that's, that's what we're working toward, um, is making sure we need more rental period, both affordable and market rate. And this project will help us do that market rate and then use it to leverage resources to create the affordable piece as well. So it's an and, it's not an or. Well, I'm good with and, I'm good with and, but don't put so much emphasis on the other side of it when this not, that's not the project before. Oh, I, I agree. I'd rather just talk about the abatement bill today and not get into all the nitty gritty on the CBA, but I know folks on the committee had a lot of questions about it, so. Well, I'm talking about your presentation. You talked about it, he talked about it. So you all were putting emphasis on it as though that was the saving grace of all of this, that you, with the community benefit agreement and the $60,000, yay, yay, yay for the market rate, because I got all this over here taken care of. Well, I don't see that, and that's what I'm saying. Okay. I don't feel comfortable with it. And I don't feel comfortable if the financier doesn't know the other numbers yet. So I don't feel comfortable. That's what and, I, and I apologize for that. I, you know, in my community, we've been talking so much about this, and I know that. Don't rush. That Let me the, tell you something. If you've only been working on this a year, you're ahead of most people at this point working on projects like this. So a year is nothing to get one of these done. It really isn't. So don't rush. I think Rob will say a year is a lot for his No, pocketbook. it's not. <laughs> so, so, so the challenge we're having with, with financing, and given that we're in early November, is uh, in an untested market like uh, the 15th Ward where we're building a new project, um, we're kind of under the mercy of uh, maybe we have a, a bad winter and we have to spend a lot of premiums on, um, you know, sealing concrete that otherwise could be treated differently if it was warmer. Um, so that's, that's one example where our construction costs for supply and materials could go up um, given weather events, but also um, with the feds possibly raising commercial interest rates, um, our margins are thin enough that if we have an increase in rate by about 1% on our construction loan, it would essentially make this project not 
financeable or um, our investors could pull out. So the urgency is certainly there for us, for stakeholders that have been working on this for a year to get this project out of the ground before we do potentially have a rate hike or material costs go up. Um, and that's just the nature of building in winter. But moreover, um, our concern is that by not moving forward with this project um, soon, that we'll be unable to hit that peak lease period in the summer season next year, where we end up with a building that is, is not being leased up fast enough to get the return uh, and pay back to our debt service and also equity partners as well. Well, I think, I think part of that is true. The other part is, uh, and if you work for Green Street, you should know this. Uh, so we go in, we do a quick change on the architectural plans. If we believe that material cost is going to go up on a project, so we cut three inches off our countertop or whatever, we, we do the adjustments to get the cost down, and, and everybody's happy. So there's a way you keep the original design and you cut the cost. So that part of it, I don't care about that. But understand that don't rush. The worst thing you can do is to rush. Uh, when I think about all of the, the units that are developed in this town every year, it, it, we've been through a lot of headaches with some of them. And so that's why I'm suggesting to you, don't, don't feel like you have to rush. Uh, and you know, you happen to have an attorney standing up there next to you that I respect. And so I know he's going, he wants to tell me something that's going to help me. <laughs> <laughs> and I might let him do that in a moment. But um, I, just want to, I, I just want to make sure that you, you, you understand that part of it. Okay? And, and I know you have residents in here. And, and, and to some of them, this is new. Um, but I want people to understand that um, housing development is, it can be very easy. But it could also be extremely difficult if we put the haste to it and if we put the pipe dreams to it. And so we don't want either one of those. Uh, we want you to be successful. Um, and I want you to understand that at the end of the day, the city of St. Louis is doing well with affordable units, OK? We're doing extremely well. As a matter of fact, we need to do some about filling up some of them. Uh, when I look at just how many have been developed recently, looking at the different wards, I know the fifth ward, I think, has developed the most affordable units. I'm second with you know, developing affordable units. Uh, I'm probably, no, I'm not first. You, you got me first on market rate. <laughs> but I'm probably second on market rate. But uh, so we're, you know, you don't have to rush. You don't have to rush. And don't let the weather scare you either, OK? I can tell you the temperatures of laying the foundations and all of that, you'll be good. And based on the weather forecast, we're going to be OK. And all you need is a window of two weeks to make that happen. So there's a lot of things, and you know this, if you, if you were in that part of development with Green Street and some of those other people. Because when you say you work for somebody, I don't know where you work. But if you were truly in the mix, you would know all those things. So um, I want to leave my comments because I really wanted to talk to the people from the association uh, because I, I don't like people getting uh, false, false expectations and they need to show me what they've done. And that's just a sidebar. It has nothing to do with your bill, okay? Uh, attorney, did you have something you wanted to say to just, me? Just a moment, please. Uh, <laughs> David Sweeney, attorney for, for my client. Um, I think you bring up a great point about perception with this CBA, bluntly, because it's not before you. And we're talking about it, but ultimately you guys have no control. And, and no disrespect to the alderman of the 15th, that's a problem for my client, because he's at the mercy of the alderman there. Um, and that's why we have to have a CBA, in my opinion, that's for the whole city, that's reviewed by everyone. Absolutely. And that's where the miscommunication comes in affordable housing and the words in that. But in my client's defense, he, as you all know, when a developer comes to your office, they're going to do what you'd like them to do. Right. Absolutely. And, right. that's the, and that's the way it is, and that's, that's the way it should be. However, this project was introduced. It's been around. We recognize that. He's tried to do 
appease everyone at this point. Mm -hmm. um, Sean Spencer will get, that needs to be talked about for sure. Mm -hmm. And as you said, you said yourself, that's not even before you guys. It's not tied to the bill or anything else. And that's important for everyone here that's in the audience to know that this has nothing to do with the Board of Aldermen. And it really emphasizes the push, in my opinion, and mine only, up to do a citywide one. And if we do these little side ones, that's not fair to folks that want to do business in the city of St. Louis, because there's not enough checks and balances. Well, not only that, one of the things that, that when I'm educating my community that I represent about community benefit agreements, don't use that and then you get so heavy handed with it that you lose your project. Uh, and then you also set the tone where nobody else will come to your community because they don't want to deal with you. <laughs> and sometimes a community benefit agreement is a powerful tool by just the development taking place. That is the, uh, that is the benefit to the community, just the development. And sometimes we have to, you know, we need to break things down a little bit more and not put our own ideologies into these kind of things because we get our residents confused, number one, about their power, and then we get, them co then we get the developers confused. Well, what is it that you really want? I don't need to come to your neighborhood. I got all the rest of the region I can go and develop in. I don't need this headache. And so, and, and I want to deal with reality in these systems too. And so, uh, it, it, it just, that sidebar brings confusion to this. A absolutely. And you know this, you've been here just as long as I was and have been. No other market rate has brought in this affordable housing thing. You guys don't, no one's ever, and this guy in his first projects had to go through all of this. And that's not even in the bill. No. And that's my emphasis no. to everyone sitting here is he simply clearly qualifies his grades off the charts. And we know that's not always the case. Trust me, I have clients that I sit here that don't have this. That, but this is a great, and I say this also as a resident. I live in the 15th Ward just like Rob does. We live on the same street two blocks down from each other. So, I mean, we're just, we're vested. This isn't some guy coming from out of town, coming from Ladue, where we ask where different offices are. I'm at a law firm that's in the city. I live in the city. And I just really want to stress this CBA, I think, is he's tried to do what he's trying to do at every step and appease everyone. But the bill speaks for itself, I think. All right. Thank you very Thank much. you. Thank you for the time. I needed that. Thank you. I'm yeah. done, sir. Um, Alderman Kotar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, I guess my first question might actually be for Jonathan. Um, I know we got a new version of the financial impact statement or report today included in our packet. I've got the one that was emailed to us, I think, yesterday or over, maybe it was Friday. And what I'm, I guess what I'm curious about is the, um, I guess the developer, the, the, the developer uh, return mm -hmm. with and without incentives. Um, the sources and uses appear the same on both, yet the, that number's changed dramatically from last week. We had an 11% return without incentives, an 11.3% return with incentives on the old version. Now we're at 5.4 and 5.8 respectively. So I'm hoping Jonathan could speak to it. And you may have in your remarks, and I may have missed that. I apologize. But could yeah, you I, did, I didn't address it in my remarks. Um, it's completely my error. Uh, it has nothing to do with the project. It's. Um, uh, as I think you probably know um, when I've what I've done with these projects is I've created a template uh, in Excel so that I can put variables in that will do a lot of calculations for me. And one of the things that I do is it uh, stop me if I'm getting too much into the weeds. No, that's fine. One of the things I do is I've got uh, I have to estimate how much residual value is left over at the end of sale if there's an uh, an incentive and. Um, in this particular case, I had an error in my formula where it's, it basically double counted the sale value in year 10. Um, so what I do is I fix that. So I was basically saying that they sold the property twice, which obviously they can't do. Got it. Thank you. That, that's, I appreciate the work you do on these. I know it's, you're constantly refining and everything. That's exactly the answer I was looking for. Thank you. Okay. Um, I guess I've got a couple questions for the developer. Um, looking at sources here, um, what's that? This is currently a car wash, right? Yes, it's is a, it still in operation? It was until about two months ago. Um, right. The upkeep of the, the operational, I mean, three maybe three of the booths out of four weren't working, um, and we were sold on uh, false pretenses that it generated uh, some revenue. How's the ground? 
the, the, for underneath yeah. as far as soils um, and contamination. So we've done a phase one environmental study, nothing came back. Um, the only thing that we do have to remediate on that property is there's some old asbestos insulation in the ceiling of the building. We've, uh, we've got a NESHAP, NESHAP notice with Missouri D Department of Natural Resources to get that abated um, in you know, hopefully relatively soon. Okay, and are you seeking any incentives on that front, on the remediation side? N no, it, okay. it's so minor that, it, that we just need to basically wet the um, insulation so that when we remove it, it's not blowing around into the atmosphere. Okay, um, so I see you're going to have some retail, right? How much retail? Correct. Um, we have about 55 to 6,000 uh, square feet, depending on um, if we have some common area changes. Um, I know John is here. He can speak to how we're going to lay that out. But we're in discussions with a couple of users right now. Um, and I think I alluded to You mentioned one with maybe a bank or a credit union. We're, we're hoping to get a credit union um, within that. There's currently no banking service uh, along Morgan Ford. The closest credit union would be the St. Louis Community Credit Union that's on Chippewa, maybe a mile and a mile so south. Um, but as far as that current residents of the 15th Ward have been using the 7-Eleven that's adjacent to our property. Um, they have an ATM inside, and that's the only banking service on Morgan Ford. I mean, in okay. quotes. I and think what are you so. thinking for the other commercial space? Um, we're hoping something that fits with the neighborhood um, scale. We, we don't. We're, we're trying, if possible, to get local city-owned businesses to move in um, that would kind of keep this independent business spirit along the Morgan Ford Business District. So we don't anticipate um, trying to solicit sort of a big national chain retailer because we, we like the kind of the character that the neighborhood ha has. So the discussions we have had have been with um, local businesses that have existing uh, bases or retail services within the city um, already. Okay. Did you explore the possibility of doing it? I know this is probably the the older woman from the 15th wouldn't like this idea, but a single site SID to potentially offset, you know, lower, lessen the uh, the tax abatement. Um, I, I can let all the women green speak to that. So. The business district looked at doing one probably, Bill, could two years ago, um, and they just found that the for them it wasn't worth it with the cost to, it wasn't going to generate enough income to, you know, get the staffing and, and all the things that, that they would need to kind of have something like the South Grand Business District. So we didn't look at a single site, but the, the, um, the business district itself did the, the work a couple years ago to figure out if they wanted to go that route and, and ruled it out. Okay. And while you're here, Ms. Uh, Alderwoman, you mentioned you've, got, you've lost like 300 rental units in the past mm -hmm. few years. Is that right? Yeah. And those have been predominantly uh, converted to single families. Mm -hmm. How many of those have been tax abated? Um, not a ton. Uh, I mean, I saw that somebody, you know, I'm, uh, you know, did this this list of some abatements that I have granted over the years. Um, I will say probably at least half of these abatements that I've sponsored have been for the Community Development Corporation uh, for affordable housing um, in our ward. And um, when I first got into office, I did grant um, some you know, single family abatements that were kind of in the pipeline before I got in. Um, and over the last couple of years have really worked to scale those back uh, to the point where the, the only abatements I'm giving right now in the 15th Ward are for incentivizing not turning something into a single family house. Okay. Um, and so of those 300 units roughly you've lost, um, do you have the breakdown of how many of those were affordable versus market rate? Um, I do not with me today. I, I got that information previously. That'd be great. I mean, since we're spending so much time talking about affordable housing, particularly as it relates to the 15th Ward with this project, I think that'd be helpful uh, for the committee to see those numbers if you could provide them. And I'm, I'm happy to, um, to echo what Dave Sweeney said, though, that you know, this is about the abatement bill that's before us, not the Well, well not I understand that CBA. we certainly have an abatement bill in front of us, but, you know, you, you, again, as my colleague from the 19th has brought up, you're the one that has decided to put this huge emphasis on affordable housing in your ward. So I think if we're going to talk about this project and these 26 market rate units and you've tied them to a community benefits agreement involving affordable housing, I think they're all uh, within the purview of this committee to discuss as we sit here today. Okay. So if you could provide those, that'd be helpful. I'm, I'm happy. I would ask that, you know, 
I will get those to you by the end of the week, but I, I would ask that we not be holding up this project any further um, while we wait for that information. Okay. And, and I will make good on, on getting that to you. Thanks. So speaking of holding up this project, um, I think the developer mentioned that he first approached you about this sometime last fall. Is that correct? About a year ago. Yes. Okay. Um, closed on the site in February. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Mm -hmm. When's the first time um, you guys had a draft of a community benefits agreement for the developer to review? Um, not. We didn't finish a community benefit agreement or bring a draft for it until August. August. So um, between February and August, no CBA. We were not sure when we started that we would need one because we were not sure that there was going to be a request for an abatement. It wasn't until April um, that, you know, going through his finances and all of that. And then it took a while for our neighborhood committees to, to get together and kind of figure out the process that they wanted to take to do this. Okay. Uh, so just to be clear, so you've had this project, you've been working on this with the developer for approximately a year, maybe more, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is the first time it's in front of our committee today, correct? It is. I will say that we thought that it was going to Alderman Cohn's committee and had been working with Alderman Cohn um, so that we would have a hearing on it when we came back from summer vacation. This is the first time this has been in front of the HUD's committee, correct? It is. This is first, this it is. Bill's first committee hearing? It, and it was introduced uh, in July and not assigned to committee until September 23rd. So, okay. you know, it's supposed to be assigned within two weeks and for some reason wasn't. And, uh, and so that kind of put us behind too in, you know, like I said, we had worked with Alderman Cohn to... Right. And last I checked, we did have a, a lengthy summer recess in that time. We did. We um, okay. but, but our rules still say a bill's supposed to be assigned within Great. two Thanks. weeks. Great. Thanks. Um, so, you know, I, I guess we're, we're now here today being asked to, you know, rush this through, pass it today, um, when you've been sitting on the project for a year. Um, so I just think, you know, the committee's going to do, if, if we need more time on this, we're going to take more time uh, to make sure we do it right, because I think we owe our constituents and uh, all the taxpayers of the city uh, the due diligence on, on all these projects. Would you agree? I would like to ask you, how long does it normally take you from conception of a project to abatement to get something in front of a committee? I guess it depends on the project, but I always make sure I set realistic expectations with the developers and their financers, including their banks. And, and I feel like we did that from day one and, and kind of working with what we knew we were going to do. And, and like I said, we thought this was going to go to a different committee. So we had been working with that committee chair. And, um, you know, it's, this was a new process for us. Um, but there, was, there also wasn't, you know, a project for us to really take to the community in a, a full-fledged form until May. Um, so it was April when he got his first kind of numbers to see that he wasn't going to qualify for financing. And after that is when we started to really do the community engagement piece, get feedback on it. He went back to the drawing board, redrew some of it to get in some of those smaller units with lower rents. Um, and then, you know, had that negotiation process going back and forth. Okay. Um, this is a question for both of you. Did you guys explore the possibility of doing a light tech project on this site? I don't know if that was already asked. Um, we, we looked into it, um, and I, I think just from our standpoint to have this project go from our current iteration to doing LIDTEC um, and the finances that were involved in that would have been uh, a process that would have taken a year and a half, two years. Um, obviously, me being a developer, I, I want to see something come out the ground uh, quickly and um, you know, d direct that in a way that is most financially feasible for people to invest money and, uh, and get financing. Got it. Thank you. I think, Jonathan, do you have something on that front? Yeah, I, um, I just want to say I think I looked into that too, and I think this area is not eligible for LIHTC because oh. the, the um, median income is too high or whatever. It's got to be in a qualified census tract, so I don't think LIHTC is available here. Got it. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I guess last on the subject of this community benefits agreement, I had a chance to review this. I mean, basically, has this been executed, this document? It has been signed, um, but again, we are not here to discuss the community benefit agreement. It has been signed. Um, I'm this ask is you about it anyway. If you don't want to answer, that's fine. I'll just ask my questions. It's out. a, you know, it's a legally binding agreement between our neighborhood association, our business association, the developer. Um, okay. So when was it? When was it executed? Oh, I forget the uh, September. 
14th. I think it was September 14th. Okay, so almost two months ago. And I see that um, what it does is, I guess, you're, there's, the, the developer is going to give $60,000 to the coalition. Is that right? Do I have that right? The coalition mm -hmm. being the business association and the neighborhood association? Correct. Okay. Um, and the purpose of that is for, well, it says here that it is anticipated that the contributions, meaning the $60,000, will be used to address affordable housing issues in the Tower Grove South neighborhood by funding down payments on new housing rental units. Is that right? Correct. So when you referred to earlier, I think you were discussing those down payments. Are those down payments for the Tower Grove Community Development Agency to purchase buildings, or are those for rental assistance? That's, I'm confused. Those are... But those are for a nonprofit, not necessarily the Tower Grove Neighborhood Community Development Corporation, because the, they want to do an RFP process and allow multiple nonprofits to, to bid on it. Um, but it is strictly for purchasing of those, not for um, down payment or not for rental assistance. Okay. But so, but within nine months, which, what's your construction time on this project, sir? Yeah. We're hoping about nine months. Nine months. Okay. Yeah. We're already two months into the agreement, though, isn't that right? Ideally, we would like to be out of the ground. Okay. But, but within nine months, um, that money can just be donated to an organ to Habitat for Humanity. Is that correct? If the, the developer wanted a safeguard in there in case the coalition members did not make good on their promise to send out an RFP and to find um, an organization that would manage this fund, that they would still, you know, be good for that donation. Okay. Well, I'll close with this. I mean, I think the project's probably a great project. I, I certainly, um, looking at the renderings looks good, the pro forma looks all right. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to beat around the bush here. I, I believe that you're using this community benefits agreement basically to just, basically to cover up what is, what I see is fairly hypocritical uh, treatment. You know, you rail against incentive projects everywhere else in the city. But now you're seeing, if you want to do new construction in your ward, it's pretty expensive. And the market's hard to support that without some sort of incentive. So in the future, I encourage you, you know, to maybe cut your colleagues some slack instead of just constantly railing against projects in their communities. Think about the construction costs, the stuff you're seeing here from this developer who's got a good project and who's been run through the ringer. Uh, I would just encourage you to please, you know, keep an open mind to projects in the future instead of just voting no simply because maybe it says SID or TIF or tax abatement. Thank you. I thank you for your comments um, and I will, you know, definitely take that to, to heart. What I'll say is, is just that um, I've never been anti-incentive. There are projects that I have voted for in the past. I do vote no on some projects. Um, and, you know, we, I have a constituency that I report to also, who is very skeptical of abatements and tax incentives, who, um, who is down my back all the time if I just went in and I voted for everything. And, um, and so at the end of the day, I have to go back to my constituents too. And that's one of the reasons we went through this process um, is because I had so many constituents who said, we want this to happen, but we're also concerned about tax incentive use. So can we find some kind of middle ground that allows us to do both, um, that allows us to not stop this from happening, but then also makes us feel as a community that we're getting um, you know, some kind of tangible good in return. And, um, and so just like you have constituents you report to, I do as well. I've gotten you know, torn apart by, you know, people in, the, in my community over this project because they don't want an abatement no matter what. Um, even with a, a community benefit agreement. Um, that wasn't the majority that our community came to, but it's a sentiment that's out there. Um, and so as somebody who you know, represents my community, I have to, I have to adhere to, to what my folks want as well. I'd like to interject here for a moment. Um, Alderwoman, I, you know, I share the frustration of the Alderman from the 7th. Um, you know, I have constituents as well, and as I think all of us up here do. Um, I happen to, to run, I'm a numbers nerd, forgive me, but I happen to run some numbers, and I noticed that, you know, you, out of your 22 board bills that you've passed down here, 18 of them have been tax abatement. Uh, and yet, you know, I guess I need to understand what's, what the, why is this project worthy of tax abatement and all the other ones that you voted against aren't? 
For me, it comes down to um, to the financial, you know, analysis that's here. I mean, I voted. Your financial on that. You think that financial analysis would even compare to, for example, the Square project that cost two hundred thousand dollars and brought two hundred jobs to the region? My concern with the Square project was that I had a friend who had been offered a fifty thousand dollar job the week before, and so we're here voting for something as if it's not going to happen, and we knew that Square had already given contracts to folks. That was my concern on that project, and and so you know if we're looking at but for tests, and, and I don't want to get into ba debating you on every project. We certainly have different, you know. Well, here, let me just these. kind of share some other numbers for you. In the last two years, your your ward has uh, had about $13 million of building permits issued. Mm -hmm. Citywide, we've had $1.3 billion. That means that projects in your ward represent less than 1% of mm -hmm. all the projects in the city. By comparison, the alderman in the seventh ward had 210 million projects during that period. That means that he had 13 times the amount of building permits issued. Mm -hmm. If we would go ahead and extrapolate the 18 board bills that you passed in your time down here, that would represent about 210 tax abatement bills. So I guess my question for you is, is of the $13 million of building permits that were issued last year, how many of those were projects that you said no to? A lot. Um, I don't have those numbers, but SLDC definitely would. Maybe I mean, I know that they get going ahead and kind of benchmarking these things. So I know they I get a lot of requests, that, and, and yeah, I'll bet you a dollar to a, a nickel that the 17th ward had 10 times more projects that did not receive incentives than what your ward did. Probably, uh, probably more like 50 or 100 times more. So Alderwoman, when you come down here, just because your perspective is that you're doing things in your ward the way you think they ought to be done, all of us would be very glad to come down here and vote against everybody else's project except for when it came to a project in their ward and then expect everybody else or at least 15 of us to go ahead and sign on to that. And I think it's a reason we need a citywide process. You know, okay, we, so we just adopted a resolution that is not necessarily in perfect form, but it was expedited because we were trying to get to it in a hurry so that we go ahead and have it done so that we could hear this bill today for you. Now the question is, is, is we've adopted that, are you going to go ahead and abide by that in the future until we reform it or what? I mean, I, I, I'm happy to abide by the things that are in that resolution. What I, what that I you agree with or that are in the resolution period? That are in the resolution. There were some things that were taken out of it that I would have liked to have seen in it. Um, you know, when it came to, you know, capping abatements well, in some oh, areas I'll and that. I'll tell you what, and, we and will I go ahead work with and you we, will, we will hold this bill if you like. I made the same offer to the older one from the six. We, we'll hold this and get it better if you like. That's the, that was the question that we've been dealing with for the last year and a half since we started this process is, is, is that this is a fluid situation with projects that need to get done that are time critical. We go ahead, we develop a model, we're trying to improve the model, and it's not perfect, but it's making progress, and yet we have some people standing up and complaining about the progress that we're making, and then they simultaneously come in and tell us to stop everything so we can take up their board bill, and we don't have a perfected model yet. You know, you, I, you don't see any irony or I, I appreciate in your comments? The, I appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, what I will say is, again, we thought that it was not coming to this com co committee, and I oh, did. Oh, but that's irrelevant, isn't it? It doesn't matter what committee. I mean, I, I could vote against your board bill on the floor of the board, couldn't I? You can, yes. I mean, I, I don't know what to say. We, we have difference of opinion on, on some of these things. I know so the I, point is, is, is we're supposed to honor aldermanic courtesy when you come before us, but when the alderman from the 7th or the 19th or the 18th or, or this, myself, the 17th, when we have something down here that our communities negotiated and work with, 
uh, because you don't agree with it and because somebody says no, you want to go ahead and you want to run for citywide office so you stand up and say, hey, look at me, I'm, I'm a hardliner against abatements and everything. But then when it comes to something in your ward and your neighborhood wants you to go ahead and support a project, it's, we're all supposed to come down here and, you know, say, oh yes, let's rubber stamp this, it's for Megan. You know, it's for I, I am not asking, I mean, I wish that we went through this level of vetting with every single bill that comes in front of us. I mean, this, this, I think this is a great conversation that we're having today, because we're- You know, we're, we've been having the conversation on the HUDS committee for the last two years. You're not on the HUDS committee right now because of the number of meetings that you missed while you were on the HUDS committee. So, I'm sorry, now I got us out of order here. Let's go ahead and return back to some of the, uh, the folks who are on the committee. Wants to speak. Um, we have next up. I think the president wants to speak. Well, well oh, Mr. President. No Mr. President. Um, Thank you. All the women, are you familiar with Rule 57? The board? I don't have the rules in front of me at the moment. Yeah, no, I know. Uh, rule 57 is reference to committee. It's the rule that you quoted earlier, and you <laughs> said that. Um, Essentially, my office or I uh, had ignored Rule 57 or violated Rule 57 uh, in, in assigning your bill to committee. Right? Do you remember when you introduced the bill to the uh, to the Board of Aldermen when it was introduced? I think it was July 14th or 15th, something like that. And, and when did we go down? Uh, we went down. That was our last meeting. That was our last meeting. And when did we come back in session? Uh, the September 6th or 7th, something like that, right after Labor Day. Right, all right. So what is your recollection of Rule 57? My understanding is within two weeks of a bill being introduced that right, let me it just, goes to committee. Let me just read it so you understand exactly what Rule 57 says. On the second day before the date on which a bill is to be formally introduced, Wednesday for a Friday meeting, the original bill shall be given to the president of the Board of Aldermen. Did you give me the original bill? We filed the bill. You never turned the bill over to our office. We had to go find it. Uh, for, uh, for a committee assignment, the president shall make these assignments in a timely manner so that they may be announced by the clerk no later than the second subsequent regular meeting. So the sec second subsequent regular meeting would have been on July 14th, I mean, uh, September 15th. So was it assigned by S September 15th? No. Yes, it was. It, uh, I asked for records from the, the clerk the and bill, I was told September bill, 23rd and the, I can forward you those records. The bill was assigned by September 15th. There was a letter that went to the clerk and everybody by September 15th. So the bill, the assignment was made. During, I, I during, apologize during, if I during, misspoke, right. but that, that is the information during, that I was given. During the break, during the break, understanding that the assignments are made by me, the president of the Board of Aldermen. During the break, did you pick up the phone and inquire or ask me um, where I might be assigned in the No, and, and I have admitted okay. that All is right. that is my fault that I, I assumed. So, you, so, 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 that, so that entire summary, you, you wasted talking to another committee chairman when it would have been easier if you had picked up the phone and contacted me and said, hey, where, where will you be signing that bill? And I would have told you yes. HUDs and you could have been working with this chairman. Of course, I, so I, that's all I have on Okay, that. I, I apologize. I mean, Dale Rusatz made the same false assumption that I did. Um, and we went forward and rectified it when we could, but thank you, Mr. President. Okay, I apologize. I really got us out of schedule here. Uh, the alderman from uh, the 24th, it's his turn, and I uh, apologize, alderman, for Thank you, Mr. Chair. In the questioning order. Um, I have a couple kind of simple questions and comments. First of all, I uh, just want to say hi to Rob. Is he still here? Hey, Rob. <laughs> Rob and I used to work together. Um, uh, my comment is, the I think, the building itself. Personally, I think it would be a great addition. I know they have worked very hard on planning this building. I would kind of like to apologize because, uh, I, well, I'd like to acknowledge all the work that Rob has put into this. I think many developers put a lot of work into this type of thing. Um, I think Rob has done 
probably gone above and beyond even what, what most people have to do. And I think it's cost him and his partners a lot of money. And it's actually increased the cost of the project. I noticed there were something like $360,000 of soft costs included in the project. And I can only assume that some of that is related to the fact that they bought the, the property in February and they've had carrying costs now for uh, nine months already. I see Rob nodding, so I don't think that's an incorrect assumption. So, um, so sorry Rob, my comments, don't take my comments to reflect on your efforts at all, please. Um, quick question for the sponsor of the bill or if anybody else in the room can answer these, th that's fine. Our, is the Tower Grove Business Association a nonprofit? Is it like a 501c3? Uh, yeah. It is. Is the Tower Grove Neighborhood Association a nonprofit? Yes. And um, the Tower Grove CDC, I assume, must be a nonprofit as well. Okay. Just wanted to clarify those things. Um, so, clearly, the CBA is. I'm going to explain why I think the CBA is, is central to really what we're talking about today. Um, and actually central to a lot of discussion about incentive reform and dialing back the level of incentive that is required to do projects in St. Louis. Um, why do I think it's central? I think it's central based on, uh, on your words, actually. So your words were, I'm reading from your post. When a developer approached me about a year ago with a mixed use project idea that met many of the attributes of our neighborhood plan to be built at the car wash site, I told them to move along with developing a plan with one caveat, and I'm gonna skip ahead. I am also very conscious of the negative impact that tax incentives can have on city and school district revenues. For this reason, I would require a community benefits agreement with neighborhood groups if he wished to seek and qualified for any tax incentives. So the only caveat, according to you here, was an executed CBA. I'm gonna read from state law now about conflict of interest, uh, the conflict of interest statute. This is statute 105.452. Prohibited acts by elected and appointed public officials and employees, no elected or appointed official or employee of the state or of any political subdivision thereof shall act or refrain from acting in any capacity in which she is lawfully empowered to act as such an official or employee by reason of any payment, offer to pay, promise to pay, or receipt of anything of actual pecuniary value paid or payable or received or receivable to herself or to any third person, including any gift or campaign contribution made or received in relationship as to a condition of the performance of an official act, sidebar such as introducing a bill, other than compensation to be paid by the state or political subdivision. So you stated that the one caveat to introducing this bill was an executed CBA. I have the executed CBA in front of me. It requires a $60,000 cash payment by the developer to an unnamed third party. And state law, I would say, it's pretty clear, directly contravenes that type of deal making um, for official acts by elected officials, such as introducing a bill. So, I'm not a prosecutor, I can't, you know, I can't determine what would happen here, but clearly, to my eye, this, this is not within the spirit of conflict of interest law that the state <coughs> has written that applies to every elected official in the state. So, on to the tax abatement bill itself. The 10-year the nominal value so what, one thing we have had a lot of discussions about is the impact of tax incentives to both the city's budget and to St. Louis SLPS. And it gets fair to say you have been a critic of the way those incentives have been administered and 
maybe I'm editorializing here, but a particular critic of the fact that they impact the school district actually a lot more mm -hmm. than they impact the city's budget because roughly 60% to two thirds of a property tax bill would go to the school district if it's, if it's paid. Um, so property tax abatement has a much bigger impact on the school district's budget than on the city's budget. The population the school district serves, if you kind of look at them on average, is the, the neediest population in the city of St. Louis. It's poverty rate is higher than average, it's homelessness rate is higher than average. Um, the school district uh, serves students, children that need more help basically than the average resident of St. Louis and certainly more than the average resident of the region. So the, the, the non paint the deferred, the, not deferred, the amount of property taxes that were, would be abated via this project with a 100% tenure tax abatement are $465,794 according to the SLDC calculation. The CBA payment of $60,000 is based on 10% of the total tax abatement value which is about $600,000. Um, so why not, why not if we're increasing the cost of the developer by forcing them to make a cash payment on the front end of the project in order to do the project, why not just dial back the incentive level so that they pay some of those property taxes, we do 80% abatements, we do 90% abatements, and most of that money they would pay would go directly to the school district, which I think probably everyone in the room agrees needs more funding. That would also be directly in accordance with what studies like the PFM study suggested the city do with tax incentives. The PFM study, which I think most of us have read very carefully, said that the one thing that stood out about the way incentives were administered in St. Louis is that aldermen play way too large a role in tax abatements. Mm -hmm. CBAs like this, according to your own words, require aldermen to interject themselves in deeper into that process because you required you required the CBA. I'm going to disagree a little bit with that. Um, I've had a lot of constituents push me for CBAs. They want to see that. I was not somebody who was negotiating that CBA. I was there if there were questions about tax incentives, question, if I needed to contact a subject matter expert, we had Jonathan Ferry come in and meet with the committee for hours on hand. Um, but the, at the end of the day, the people that were negotiating it were the Neighborhood Association and the Business Association. It was not something that I was negotiating, um, but I made good on the, the promise to constituents that I wasn't going to move forward with the project unless they were able to reach some kind of agreement on, on what they wanted to see from it. So here's some more of your words. I first learned about community benefit agreements nearly three years ago, the local progress, national convening, et cetera, et cetera. Right away, it seemed like a process that St. Louis needed to adopt. And again, for this reason, I, I meaning you, would require a community benefits agreement with neighborhood groups if he wished to seek and qualify for any tax incentives. So according to your own words, you are the reason that they had to do, they had to execute this CBA. Now, I don't know who negotiated it. Maybe you didn't negotiate it. That I don't have information either way. But you are the person that put that process into effect. You could also have made a decision to simply reduce the amount of incentive. And you know, taxes are sort of the original community benefit agreement. You build something, it's assessed a higher value, and you pay taxes. And the entire community, through a democratic process, where the funds are available to the entire community. This, this type of CBA makes the implicit argument that a $60,000 cash payment to a local nonprofit that can only be used within the 15th ward, which is what the CBA says, is more important than funding the school district, which serves students throughout the entire city. So, and if, if I could interrupt, I didn't you, ask a question. Okay. Now, 
let's imagine a scenario where all 28 of us start requiring a CBA on every comparable type of project. Maybe the, not, maybe the issue I most care about, and this is hypothetical, and it's not true necessarily, <laughs> but it's a hypothetical, maybe the issue I most care about is sending children to religious schools. So the CBA that I require from a developer working in the 15th ward is I say, look, you can get this tax incentive. I'll give you this tax incentive. And I'll, in fact, I'll give you a bigger tax incentive than you might otherwise get. You're going you're gonna to not pay any property taxes to the school district. But I'm going to make you sign an agreement that says you will pay the tuition of 20 students within the 20, 24th ward to go to a private religious school. I'm going to divert money from the public school district and put that same amount of money into private schools. Now, I wouldn't do that. I've been in that scenario. I think a lot of constituents would actually support that idea. A lot of my constituents would. But I would never do that because I don't think that's how tax incentives should work. And I don't think that's fair. And I don't think it's our role to divert public money into private uses like that. I think we're going to have the strongest city when we fund the basic things like the public school district, which serves tens of thousands of <laughs> students that become adults in this city. Um, moreover, this idea that since, there, since we have no citywide CBA framework, what, what the Pandora's box we are opening here is that any alderman can negotiate a CBA in any way they see fit. They can require payments. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying you are doing this. I'm not making an allegation, but I'm saying this is the Pandora's box. They could require payments to friends, associates, family members, business interests they're connected with, a nonprofit they want to get a job with next year when they are not on the board of aldermen anymore, whatever, right? This type of process is ripe for the exact type of abuse that residents find abhorrent. I'm not saying you are abusing it, but I'm saying you are opening the door to that type of abuse. And, and, and once, is, you, once you have done it, it suddenly becomes necessary for us to justify uh, incentives in our own areas. People are going to say, well, what, who, did, who, who did you facilitate getting paid in our area? <laughs> In the so, 15th ward, they got a nonprofit got a $60,000 check. Where's our $60,000 check? You know, the, the church needs a new bell. I want, I want a $60,000 check. So, so could I interject just for a second? True CBAs, if they're, they're really done as a community-led process, aldermen are not a part of that. Elected officials are not. That's a hypothetical. That's not what we're dealing with here. I'm talking about That's your what, bill. What I'm saying, though, is, is I understand your concerns. These types of agreements are done in cities all across the country. Um, you know, Detroit had, they, they've tried. They, um, they had a good CBA uh, bill that ended up getting gutted, but we, the long and short of it is we have an ability to empower our communities in some of the, the decision-making process and why, why take do you, us out. Why do you think empowering a community, why do you think it's empowering a community to take $60,000 that could easily go to the school district and giving it to a nonprofit for what amounts to a blank check? It's not specified what that money is supposed to be, is definitively supposed to be used for. What is empowering the community about that? Because it was their choices. So they looked through. They looked at the school financing, and um, they looked at decreasing abatement. And, and Jonathan Ferry came and, and met with a bunch uh, with kind of the negotiation committee and talked about you know decreasing abatement versus uh, you know increasing you know the amount to affordable housing. We did surveys of the community and and. You know, unfortunately, the school funding piece was not the thing that ended up being um, even close to what folks wanted. And the, you know, over 60% of people that responded to the survey they wanted affordable housing, and so the the group that was negotiating it went with what you know they were continuing to hear from community members. So the group, there's nothing in this CBA, as I read it, I tried to read it carefully that would prevent the groups from, that negotiated the CBA 
from awarding themselves as $60,000. They're all nonprofits. All it says is that, let me, the coalition shall have the right in its sole and absolute discretion to determine what nonprofit corporation or corporations shall receive the contributions set forth in subsections A and B above. So the coalition, the three people that decide, if I remember the, the CBA correctly, could choose to award their own nonprofits at $60,000. I believe it also talks about, you know, that nonprofit needing to have experience in affordable housing, which neither one of those organizations have. Tire Grove CDC does, though. But they are not a co-signature on this. They are not a coalition member. Okay. Um, they helped answer questions when folks had questions, and that's it. That, it's a little hard to swallow all of that, I will say. Um, so my, look, my idea of incentive reform is not that we create a system where we drive up costs for developers, then require, which then requires them to ask for more incentives, which then negatively impacts the school district even more. My, my ideal for how we reform incentives, which is, and the, and the resolution we just passed is going in this direction, is where we apply a lot more scrutiny to determine what the level of incentive the developer needs so that we're not over-incentivizing, we're not unnecessarily taking money from the school district, and when we can, we are, we are paying the school district sooner. So when there's an increase in property value, a lot of it might get abated, but they might be paying at least 10 or 20 percent of the normal value. So they get the money in year one. They don't have to wait 10 or 15 years to get the money. Um, so for that reason, I am not comfortable with this at all. I think it's illegal according to state law. I think it's bad policy for the school district. I think it's bad policy for, for 28 of us to try to embark on. And I would be far more, I don't want to, I, I want the building to get built because I think the developer's done a ton of work I like and I think it's project, a good building. So I, I would recommend we just amend the bill to 80 or 90% tax payment for the 10 years and go from there and, and excise, at least excise the $60,000 payment from the bill, which I think is the part that is most objectionable and most problematic in the future. Thank you. I agree. Thanks. I, I mean, I'm willing to do that. I would have to go back to my community, and I'm not sure that they would support this project without a CBA. So, so this is the, the conundrum we're in, but I'm happy to have those conversations. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to make, I'm not going to make a bad decision because you put yourself in a box. I'm gonna make the right decision for the city and for our policy. And so that's what I think, okay? That's my personal opinion. And I think, I think we are making a much bigger mistake than we think we are if we allow this to go forward as it's written. Well, um, Alderman, thank you for your comments. Um, I. I think you've raised a number of issues that we as a committee need to, to probably discuss here, but I, uh, in deference to the folks who have been waiting to both ask questions and speak, I'm going to go ahead and proceed, and I think you have uh, raised a number of things that we should come back and talk about. Alderwoman Boyd, uh, do you have any questions? Alderman Bosley, do you have any questions? Uh, no, sir. Um, <clears throat> Alderman Odenberg. I do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, can the developer come back up here? How are we doing, Rob? Need a sandwich? No, I, I, no, no, I figured fine. I'd call you up there because I know how comfortable those seats are. So, so thank you. <laughs> um, I'm sort of always a, at, a, at a quest to make sure we're arriving at a true public good. So I do like to understand um, maybe some of the assumptions that your financing partners are, are putting on this project. Um, you talked a little bit about the retail tenancy, I think, with the alderman from the 7th in his line of questioning. Um, do you know, is the bank 
are they discounting the commercial lease assumptions and the revenues that, that you've put in your pro forma? Uh, so our revenues and lease assumptions in the pro forma based on prevailing market rates for the neighborhood. So we had a commercial broker look at what we think we can get for the lease rates on the low level commercial space. Yep. And they've been built into the pro forma, I believe. They're at, uh, and my, my business partners are out in the West Coast, so they're between 18 and 20 to a foot on the three. But you don't know if, you're, if the bank is sort of doing a sensitivity analysis and discounting the commercial lease? The, the, the discounting has not been done by the bank. No, okay. it's 100%. It's it is what it is. They're underwriting based off of our pro forma at, at this current point in right. time. I will note that um, it is pretty aggressive for a financing institution to be lending at a loan to cost of 80%. That's certainly not market. So I think that to me, what that says is that proves that um, they really are relying heavily here on your operating expenses being lowered vis-a-vis -vis the tax abatement that we're discussing here. So if there's lower operation costs with the tax abatement, that's why they're able to stretch to an 80% loan to cost. Typically, in, in commercial banking world, in my experience, 65 to 70% tends to be the standard. So I think, if, if I'm hearing correctly, that, that to me, that's proving out the but for here, the but for for this for this incentive in this board bill in front of us. Um, Rob, would you have pursued this project without tax abatement? I think I answered my own question just in a statement there, but I'd like to just hear. So I mean, going to square one and going way back, um, I wanted to build something that in my opinion and my business partner's opinion was the highest and best fit for that site in that particular neighborhood. Um, when I initially chatted with Megan and various stakeholders in the neighborhood, we were just trying to make this process as relatively straightforward and as simple as possible. Um, once we started talking to lenders, uh, some of which in, in the city of St. Louis, uh, local banks or larger banks are, are relatively conservative, we found out pretty quickly that to do a project with um, you know, prevailing construction rates in St. Louis and uh, untested new product market rent per square foot, that it was not going to be feasible to do this project without an abatement. So short answer, no. no. Um, and in your opinion, um, is this deal dead without the, um, without the execution of the community benefits agreement? In yeah. other words, if you wanted to say, you know what, sorry, the last nine months was an incredible waste of time and incredibly reckless to the city, but I'm going to do this project without this CBA. Um, I, I look at everything. Do you have support of political leadership, in your opinion, uh, without the CBA? Without the CBA, sorry, re rephrase that question. Is again. the CBA? Is the deal dead without the community benefits agreement? We just want, at this point, to build the building. Um, so we would like to move forward with the abatement as its current iteration stands. And we're willing to work and have been working with everyone involved to make uh, what we think is the optimal strategy for moving forward. Right. Yeah. I mean, so, so what I'm hearing and what I think is, has been um, at least inferred to here in other aldermen's comments is that the CBA should be part of this bill, and I would argue that it is expressly part of this bill, um, and it is tied to it. So that's why I think it does it does um, it does behoove us on this committee to understand and unpack it a little bit. Because what I'm trying to get to is consistency, consistency for entrepreneurs and risk takers like yourself, real estate professionals like yourself, to not be dealing with a patch quilt of agreements and a patch quilt of the process um, when you want to invest money and your partner's money and equity into the city, which I think we desperately need and, and encourage that. So thank you again for taking up a project in the city of St. Louis and in your ward around your corner. Um, knowing what you've kind of experienced and know now, um, would you do the process over again? I, I think it I mean, from a purely developer standpoint, would I, I would like to have built this project and moved forward in the most streamlined and efficient process. Has it been the most streamlined and efficient process? I think everyone could answer no. Um, but I'm fully aware that the city of St. Louis is somewhat unique 
within um, its its own framework. And uh, as a developer, that's a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> and as a as a developer, we we obviously try and we, we would like to move forward within um, a framework that everyone can be agree in agreement with. Sure. Um, but it, you know, it, it has candidly, it's been challenging. And I'm not only speaking for myself, but I do have to go and report to business partners as well as various yeah. stakeholders um, who are continually asking us, hey, how are you doing on this project? We've invested X amount of dollars. We'd like to see this come out of the ground. And what are your, you know, otherwise, why are we, you know, giving you money? Sure. And, and it, it, it is challenging, therefore, for someone like myself who is very vested in the city of St. Louis and would like to do future projects to seriously want to continue to, to do future projects in the city of it is somewhat challenging. Sure, because I think what, what, what you just said underscores if you have a project you want to do downtown or near downtown or in another part of, of, of the city, um, it's a mystery door of what the process might be, right? I mean, because if, if you're saying, well, here's what we did in the 15th Ward uh, uh, with the older woman and, and the, in the community, um, they may not necessarily be the same process. And I think that's what this committee has been trying to get considerable work to and President Reed's leadership around a community benefits bill that he's filed and that we're working on. Um, there's been a lot of work to, to try to bring that consistency. So I'm sorry you're kind of in this this pinch point here um, with your project, because I think it's a good project and, and I encourage it and I welcome it and I support it. I will say that. Um, thanks, Rob. Uh, Alderman, can I ask you a few questions, please? I think, would you say, um, just based on the discussion that's taken place in the committee thus far, that this community benefits agreement is more than less tied to this tax abatement bill? Right, in other words, your support of it is really tied to it. Knowing that my community supported the project. Okay. So if you would, can you talk to me, now that we've established that I think the Community Benefits Bill really is part of this, um, can you talk to me a little bit about the organizations of Tower Grove South and Tower Grove Business Associations specifically? Uh, what's their board compositions? Do you, we, can we be provided a copy of their bylaws? Do they have the proper financial controls? Do they have the proper professional staff to administer funds, to run an RFP process? Those are things that are alarming to me when we're looking at giving a project um, tax dollars or withholding tax dollars uh, to, to the city's general revenue fund. I would like to know who the fiduciary agents are um, in a payment if like that. If you want to put those in a all of the things that you just said in an email or a list, I'm happy to get all of that to you. Um, I don't know all of the names and backgrounds off the top of my head. What I'll say with Tower Grove South is they divided the ward up into quadrants mm -hmm. so that there's representatives that sit on the board that represent every single quadrant in the ward just to make sure it's not just you know wealthy areas of the ward or whatever that have representation on that, that board, that it's really um, holistic of the entire neighborhood. Um, the business association, and, and I know that um, Bill can speak to that when, when he gets the opportunity to speak, and, sure. and kind of all of the folks yeah. that are involved with that. I think where I'm going with this and, and is that, you know, do, do those organizations, um, and, and if we support this, right, the city supports this project in the way of tax abatement, we're effectively supporting a community benefits or an arrangement that was made by the community. And I think that's important. If stakeholders come together and they want to form a contract with, with a developer and, and or businesses, I, I think that's something that, that's worthwhile. Uh, I think it becomes, I think it eviscerates the concept and the point, though, when we don't know who, who it is that will be running an RFP process, do they have the wherewithal in terms of enforcement of compliance? There are voluntary boards. I'm sure all these are voluntary boards and not professionally staffed. So they could go away overnight and then there's a default process to Habitat for Humanity. Well, will they be around in the next five to 10 years? I, I don't have a look at their operating statement. I assume they will be, but this is the concern I have and this is sort of the unraveling of the, of the of the quilt, I think, with, with what's been created here with, with a real estate development project connected to this CBA. So, um, and I think this all comes back to parameters and consistency, because I think Rob just said in a very diplomatic and um, humbling way that this process is screwed up. Mm -hmm. And this committee, I would say, um, I would laud this works committee, the chairman, uh, on trying to get consistency. And it does seem, it is a little disingenuous 
I think, when we have um, projects like this that sort of sp are in direct contravention to the work that we've been trying to do and build a coalition with all our colleagues at the board and, and citywide with stakeholders. Um, so with that, I have no further questions and we'll yield time back to uh, the chairman or anyone else who has questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alderman. Um, we, uh, we've gone through the committee now. We have now um, several speakers who have signed up. Here, right in front of me, I'll just do this. Um, we alternate pro and con. Um, Mr. Maltry, did I pronounce, Mal Maltry, forgive me if I mispronounce that, has already spoken. Uh, so speaking against the project is Karen Franz Cohen. Is Karen still in the room? Okay. Ms. Cohen, Franz Cohen. Yeah, good. Good morning. <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Um, it still is morning. Um, so, Alderman Rohde, thank you for having an open process here, committee members, um, uh, President Reed, um, to get imp input from concerned citizens. So, I just provide this, this perspective. I am a 41-year resident and property owner in the city of St. Louis. I'm a retired St. Louis public school early childhood education teacher for 32 years. And I am the parent of three children who grew up in the city and went to the city schools, a choice which many teachers do not make. Um, I stand in opposition to all tax abatements and other tax-funded financing incentives through community development corporations in stable neighborhoods. I oppose tax-funded assistance for the benefit of for-profit real estate investors. If a project similar to 3172 Morgan Ford is viable, investors will make a profit. And if it is not a viable investment, they will risk that investment. As a longtime resident, I observe that community development corporations have become a conduit for private for-profit real estate uh, developers to generate income for themselves with taxpayer help. Typically these investor groups see dollar signs looking back at them from certain parcels in our city. In order to get a tax incentive and control their risk, the investors try to convince the alder person, the residents, and the business owners where their property is located that the community needs the real estate project. In this case, a 28 unit three-story apartment building with 26 parking spaces and rents of 1000 to 1500 a month. Investors claim that their bank will not approve the financing without neighborhood approval in the form of tax abatement. In my ward, an extra layer of approval has now been utilized to prove that the neighborhood agrees with the project. It is called a community benefit agreement. A community benefit agreement is negotiated between lawyers, developers, investors who are knowledgeable, and neighborhood volunteers. Time constraints are imposed by the developers who naturally want to move their project forward. Um, and the neighborhood volunteers find themselves under pressure. In our case, three neighborhood volunteers were chosen out of a hat at a monthly neighborhood meeting. Um, as these volunteers try to educate themselves about the CBI process, they are pressured and find it difficult to get useful input from residents, provide feedback to the residents, and come up with a resident-driven plan that has real community benefit. In Tower Grove South, information about meetings and a survey were only disseminated via the internet. This caused a lot of residents to have no input at all. Uh, so our communi community benefit agreement, which the neighborhood voted to try the process. We did not vote until the end where there were no uh, opposing views taken about the particular agreement that w was arrived at. So in this case, $60,000 was listed as the final offer from the developer, is pledged to an unnamed nonprofit that will be able to use the money for rent subsidies, that's what we were told, or down payments we now find in the neighborhood. 
It may be possible that some subsidies could be given to the private for-profit for investment group for the rental of their own units. In neighborhoods like Tower Grove South, where property values are not depressed, there is no reason for taxpayers to shoulder any investor risk. In my neighborhood, property values have, steadily, have been steadily increasing and are currently at a 41-year high. 3172 Morgan Ford LLC is an example of a for-profit investment group with a corner property in a neighborhood with rising property values. Tower Grove South is a vibrant, stable neighborhood. It sells itself. City residents need our tax dollars to be invested in city services. Quality schools, clean water, trash pickup, community health, public safety, police, fire, and homeless services need property, need that every tax dollar that residents and property owners can contribute for the common good of our city. Would Prop P be needed if we had fewer tax abatements? Every worthwhile real estate development needs to contribute to the city's tax base from the beginning, as many of us homeowners have done. Investors must be accountable for their own risk. Please seriously consider denying St. Louis tax incentives to any, of any kind for development in stable, growing neighborhoods and consider only offering incentives in distressed areas of the city. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Thank you Mrs. Cohen. Um, the next speaker, and again, I should have said this, I didn't want to interrupt Ms. Cohen, Ms. Ms. Cohen um, but we would like to limit it to about three minutes, although I think that was probably about three. Um, speaking in favor was uh, Mr. Bill Wagoner. Mr. Wagner, present. Good morning, uh, Chairman Rohde. Thanks for having us. Uh, committee, thanks for having us. Um, I am Bill Wagoner. I am a resident of the neighborhood as well as part of the Tower Grove Business Association. I own a business on Morgan Ford across the street from the proposed development. Um, our, our committee, our Tower Grove Business Association Committee, we held a vote on this. We've been working with Rob for six, eight, ten months, and of the neighbor or of the business association members, we only had one dissenting vote um, to proceed with this this project. Um, in addition to that, we we just feel like uh, that a good business development with new residents, with new businesses is a real strong positive for our community. It helps the other businesses, it provides jobs, it provides income, it provides income for the city. Um, based on the city's numbers, it's, it looks like a really good project. I really appreciate the work that Rob's done. A six and a half million dollar building on our street is, is, a, is a deal maker for us. It's, it's a really good thing. One of the things about the site is next door to this site is a 7-Eleven that's an infill probably from the 70s, I'm guessing, 60s or 70s. The car wash is there. So we have a full block of no buildings other than the 7-Eleven and the car wash. And you look at the car wash and you talk about highest and best use. Not only is it not highest and best use, it's kind of lowest and worst use. And when we also look at de development and we look at businesses, you, from a crime and safety standpoint, holes in our street are very are, are very undesirable, and the car wash for years and years and years, I've had the business 13 years, the car wash um, has just been a haven for awful, awful activity, and we feel like this is a really good, a really good project. A um, couple of quick things. I was also on the committee that, uh, that negotiated and sat through the community benefits agreement. So if you have any questions about that, I can kind of tell you what we did there. I'm also on the board of the Tower Grove Business Association. Some people had some, maybe had some questions about that. One of the things that the previous speaker had mentioned that I would disagree with is as part of the community benefits agreement committee, we didn't just take input from the internet. Um, there were several weekends where we went door to door. Um, this pro project and this process has been, go been going on eight or 10 months and it's a community, it's been a hot bed issue or a hot button issue and there were people who actually went door to door trying to get input. 
So um, anyway, I would, I would really ask that you consider the project just because I think it's sorely needed in our, our neighborhood. So that's what I have. Thank you. Sure. Uh, you Anybody? You were, no. sorry. you were at uh, Catholic Charities? For I was. OK, I was. yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. I yeah. Didn't hardly recognize I'm you. I'm incognito. Thank Ultimate. you. Thanks. Uh, speaking against the project, uh, Cheryl Wittenauer. Hello, everyone. It's officially afternoon, so good afternoon, <laughs> Chairman and members of the committee. Um, thank you for this opportunity to speak um, from the Tower Grove South neighborhood perspective. Thank you. Um, on this very important issue, um, this project came to my attention. I'm a very involved citizen. I'm the person that picks up litter. I'm the person that picks up other person's dog's poop when I'm walking my dog and clean up after my dog. I organize alley cleanups. I'm a block captain, have been for years. I go to meetings. I'm invested in this neighborhood. My husband and I moved there in 03. We live at 43, 46 Juniata. We moved there when the neighborhood looked pretty bleak, when it could have been helped by a tax incentive. It's not bleak anymore. I mean, I naively moved there because I had good citizen stuff ingrained in me as a Girl Scout. Hey, this neighborhood looks like it needs some help. I'm going to move there and make it better. And I have. I made it a lot better. I didn't ask, I didn't have my hand out for a tax abatement. I could have gone, to, I looked at other places and I could have gotten a tax abatement. I didn't do that. I think it's a real disservice to citizens who pay their taxes. And by the way, we're going to have a big increase when the tax bills come in December. It's a big disservice to have taxpaying citizens finance somebody's project with California backers who don't give a rat's patootie about my neighborhood. OK, they can just continue to live in Redondo Beach or wherever they live. They don't really care about my neighborhood. I care about my neighborhood. I'm opposed to this project on a lot of levels. It may look pretty inside. It's an ugly structure. It's modernist, OK, modern is all right. It's in sharp contrast to the cityscape, and we have a beautiful cityscape. It's a disservice to all these master brick builders who built this beautiful city, which is the pride of St. Louis. It's not an attractive building. It's 26 units. And you can imagine that there will be more than two people per unit because the rents are so darn high. So that means 26, there's only one parking space per unit. That means 26 individuals, then their roommate or partner and any guests that they have over are going to fill the neighborhood with excess cars. It's already a pain in the neck to try to find a parking space in my block. I'm in the first block off of Morgan Ford. 30 seconds behind. Pardon me? 30 seconds. OK. There's already there. You know, I haven't had a chance to talk. Everybody else has had plenty of time. This is our opportunity to speak. I would ask you to give us the time that we deserve. Parking's an issue. The rents. There was much made during the discussion that rents, that this, Scott, that these higher rents were going to jack up the prices of surrounding rents. In fact, there was one woman who spoke very eloquently to this point from the Tower Grove South Neighborhood Association. She ended up getting picked in, um, by random to serve, on one of the, to serve on the Community Benefits Agreement Committee. It just so happened that she did. She served, she and another person from the, com from the, commu from the community who were picked to serve on this Community Benefits Agreement Committee stepped down from the committee because they were in opposition to the direction and the trajectory that this committee was making. They stepped down. At the final vote, at the final meeting where the vote was taken, I, you know, we were given an opportunity to ask a few questions, and I do mean few. We were supposed to write it down, our questions on a piece of paper. I asked, please let this lady explain why she was stepping down. That question was never asked. I was sitting in the front row. I could see the questions being gone through and vetted. That question was never answered. Just so that you know, two people stepped down from that. The committee that made the decision was very pro-development. Um, my final statement on this whole 10-year tax abatement is, I'm sure you know more acutely than I, the city is broke, OK? <laughs> we can't afford to give raises to our police officers, and we're losing them by the droves to the county. 
We can't afford to tear down dilapidated buildings in poor and neglected parts of our city. We can't afford school crossing guards. All these points have been made in the news. We can't afford neighborhood stabilization officers, our front end people who help us fix problems in our city. They used to have them per ward or one every other ward. We don't even have enough stable neighborhood stabilization officers. We need this, this money, these tax abatements, I beg of you, if the city has to have tax abatements, give them very sparingly, give them to really neglected neighborhoods. Because right now, what it seems like to me is that we're just handing these abatements out like candy from a float at a 4th of July parade. Whoever wants them, they get them. This alderman said, approves this one, so, he, so this person's got to approve because I want one in my ward. Let's be more disc discreet, more, more, what's the word? I'm going to ask, I'm going to go ahead and ask okay. to cut off now. That's Thank you for your well time. Over three minutes. Thank you. All right. Um, Christian Herman speaking against the project. Hello, and thank you for letting us speak here. I'm Christian Herman. I have many issues with the development of 3172. I live 300 feet away from the site. I asked the alderwoman for a shadow study. She declined, saying there's other three-story buildings on Morgan Ford. While there are other three-story buildings on Morgan Ford, the front of those buildings, the top floor is stepped down. So they only cast a shadow into the street and don't affect residences are the yards of people who have nice gardens behind where the building would be made. So I asked her to reconsider her denying the study and she didn't respond. Then of course there's the abatement itself. A home three buildings to my east sold three months ago for 403K on 4200 Junietta. Two years ago, the condos next to me sold for 289K. This area doesn't require an abatement. The timeline of the developer was prioritized over community involvement. The claims about community outreach have been disingenuous. I was asked to vote in an online survey and I voted in support of the building while, added, while adding that my vote was conditional. I wanted two things, a two-story building and a condition applied to the CBA that said that the developer could not ask for a special tax district if one of his tenants were a victim of a crime. My conditional request was not acknowledged. The older woman has told you that TGS has lost 340, I'm sorry, 354 rental units. Please consider that Targo South is a very large neighborhood. From my house in Junietta, which is 300 feet away from Morgan Ford, it's a mile. I used to drive it every day when I owned a, U, a retail business on South Grand. It's also a mile from Arsenal to Chippewa. It's a very large neighborhood. So the tenants who lived in the four family to condo conversion next to me paid $400 a month for rent. They were my friends. They will not be coming back to Tower Grove South because they can't afford the 3121 rent, which ranges from $800 for a very tiny studio apartment to $1,500 for a two bedroom apartment. None of the eight businesses across the street from the car wash have a parking area. That includes a bar and two restaurants. Cheryl's already talked to you about the parking. But you have to understand that on my block, there are more rentals than single families. There are more tenants than homeowners. And most of the people living in those two and four families have roommates. So there's a huge parking issue on my street. I've seen fights. Business owners on Morgan Ford who don't live in Tower Grove South were allowed to vote in support of this project while a 15th Ward resident, who is also a member of the association, was not allowed to vote because she was told she didn't live in the neighborhood. Finally, the building itself is lacking in aesthetic appeal and will be constructed of Core 10 steel. Bridges and train cars are made of Core 10 because it's cheap, it doesn't require any maintenance. Twain, the Sarah sculpture, two blocks away from us, is Core 10 steel. Well, I love the Twain sculpture. I don't want to live within 300 feet of it. 
There has been conversations, <coughs> conversions on my block, and yet the majority of residents rent. I want to really underscore that. There's a lot of rental property left in the neighborhood. Um, also, the, being told that there hasn't been any new construction in Tower Grove South in the last 20 years is not true. One of the Tower Grove South board members bought an empty lot in 4200 Hartford and had a building built and a two-car garage on it. And City Park Grill is new. They tore down the old building and rebuilt, totally rebuilt that. When I met Megan Green in 2009, we didn't actually meet. I was the block captain coordinator. I served on the Targo South steering committee for 12 years. She wanted to speak at one of our meetings about a charter school called Active Minds she wanted to start. I didn't let her speak because we were focused on issues in our neighborhoods, but I'm not convinced she doesn't support um, public schools because she was trying to start a... Um, yeah, it's time, ma'am. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. Um, Next, speaking against the project, Gary Pay. Thank you for pronouncing my name correctly, and thank you for uh, having um, having us get a chance to speak because we didn't get a chance at the other meetings. We were cut off because we were against the project. Um, I've lived. Uh, on the 4200 block of Connecticut for 35 years. And uh, you can tell that uh, I'm not really internet savvy. And a lot of this was done on the internet and on Facebook. And uh, I think that's kind of deceptive for older people. And I know about five, six people, I don't think they have computers, more or less the uh, internet. And I don't know if you remember Geraldine Osborne, but the reason there is car wash there is because she took the first developer that came along and uh, we've suffered ever since. I don't think anybody's for the car wash staying there, but this development um, is just uh, not in character of the neighborhood and it's ugly. And the salt in the wound is the uh, tax abatement. And they're not paying sales tax either on the materials because they're buying them through the uh, Targo of South Neighborhood Association. So it's kind of a double whammy. But, uh, the parking, I, I agree with everybody else. The parking is bad. This is just going to add to it. They're going to use corrugated steel the side of the garage facing the alley, which is what they make pole barns with out in the country. That's really attractive. Um, I don't know if you remember the Terry Apartments on Morgan Ford, but that was a disaster. They were supposed to be luxury apartments, and it just went downhill. And I'm afraid if he doesn't get the right clients and there's no on-site manager, that this could have the same fate. I mean, it's right next to a 7-Eleven, and it's got all the uh, possibilities there of it going downhill. And uh, other than that, uh, I kind of thought that uh, this would be more publicized, and maybe even a bulletin sent to, there's three, four disabled people on my block that couldn't go to a meeting. And I went door to door, and I don't remember anybody coming around with a survey door to door, but the people I contacted, they said, this is the first they ever heard of it. So I don't think they got an adequate representation of our block. And, uh, I hope that uh, maybe the, re the developer reconsiders. So that's all. Thank, thank you, Mr. Pay. Thank you. Um, uh, speaking against the project, Matt Frederick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll try in my darndest to be under three minutes, but boy, could I go on. Um, I'm against the tax abatement. Um, uh, I 
commend uh, both uh, the chair and this committee for, for doing the, the, the hard work of uh, trying to uh, reform incentives. Uh, the resolution 33 is a fantastic start to that. Um, not perfect, I know you're still working on it. Um, just applying resolution 33 as, as amended to this project, uh, uh, I think it's uh, clear that the uh, sponsor of this bill is, is presenting it as if this is um, exceptional um, as opposed, and so asking you to ignore the, uh, the MVA map um, or set that aside and instead, you know, look at whether all these criteria of its exceptionalness have been met or not. They haven't. Um, the neighborhood is, is not a, a poor neighborhood. It's a very wealthy neighborhood. Uh, houses nearby have sold for $600,000. I mean, you know, that's, that's not like what Brandon Bosley was, was talking about earlier with his stuff, you know. Um, you know, there's this talk about whether it's a, you know, a net positive on, you know, with regard to revenue. You know, it probably is if they actually fill the, you know, the space up with like tenants and stuff. There's a lot of, oh yeah, we're going to get a bank. Yeah, all right, whatever. We'll, we'll see about that. Um, there's also uh, the bill sponsor and the developer has sort of um, hung their their collective hat on this idea that the return on the investment is low. Well. Yes, the return on the investment is low, but one of the reasons why is that this developer decided to overpay for a parcel. He decided to overpay for a parcel. He's in under his head, I think, you know, or he's, he's under his head, he's a little underwater here, and now he's expecting, now he's expecting that uh, the city um, get his head above water. Um, that's how I view it. Um, I know that the chairman has talked often about trying to make, um, trying to make sure that incentives aren't entitlements. I think that this is a, uh, an example of a developer who looks at this tax abatement less as an incentive and more um, as an entitlement. Um, I suggest that the uh, committee uh, looks at um, the MVA map and doesn't consider this to be an exceptional project. Also, um, as in Resolution 33, there is a criteria existence of a community benefits agreement. Um, while we went back and forth whether or not this community be benefits agreement is cognizable by the committee, I think we all agree that it is cognizable by the committee. Um, mention was made of a uh, of a $60,000 cash payment that was going to then go to actual purchase of affordable units. That's not the case. Um, as Alderman Kotar pointed out in the actual agreement, it's expected to. Um, the, the community benefits agreement presentation that we were given didn't, didn't declare that. Um, that community benefits agreement presentation um, was presented by Mr. V. Harsheff. Um, he is um, a member of the Tower Grove Community Development Corporation. Um, I think that Alderman Davis is um, on point when asking that he should be brought before this committee before this bill goes any further. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frederick. Um, our, our last speaker today, uh, speaking against the project, Kara Clark. Hi, um, thank you for letting me speak. Um, I'm a resident of the 15th Ward. Um, I first moved to the ward in 1992, um, and I've, so I've been there a while and seen the neighborhood change, and it has. It's, um, when I first moved, it was, moved in, it was um, more of a working class neighborhood, a very diverse neighborhood racially and economically. And over the last few decades, it has moved up, which is great in some ways, it's great for the city overall to have um, that increased tax revenue through those property taxes, um, which is why I don't believe this project should get an abatement. Um, it, it is critical at this point in time that the city start to leverage increased property values for the whole city, for our school district, for the police, for city services. Um, twice now this year, the city has gone to the taxpayers and asked to raise our sales taxes, and we wouldn't have to do that if we were leveraging our higher valued property in the city, for the city. Um, um, 
the, the, the value of these rents, $1.50 um, a square foot, is very speculative. Um, currently, most apartments rent around more closer to 75 cents a square foot, 80 cents a square foot. Um, so this is quite high. Um, it's possible that the developer is right and that he can get that kind of rent, but I do not believe that, that the city should be um, subsidizing speculation on real estate like that. Um, and then my last point about the CBA, um, this is a new process for the city. Um, it's something that you know a lot of people are interested in looking at citywide, and um, the particular process with this project um, was not a good process. Many people in the neighborhood are, or have been upset by how the, how the process has gone. Um, you know, the developer first, and, and the alderman first discussed this project last October, but they did not bring it to the, the community for a public, um, for public information until last June. Um, and then two months, June, June, July, and August, about two, two and a half to three months were spent knocking out an agreement, um, which was done mostly behind closed doors. Um, the, the greater community wanted to have more, more of a um, role in that process, and there just were not adequate meetings held um, to allow more, more public feedback. Um, so if we are to use CBAs going forward and have that be something to offset um, abatements and TIFs and that sort of thing, um, we need to develop a much better process than what we saw here. This was a very developer-driven process. The developer's timeline you know, was the most important factor. Um, and if it's going to be a community benefit, then the community's timeline needs to be taken into consideration as well. That's it. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Okay, that concludes today's speakers, and I'm kind of at a loss. I'm trying to read the tea leaves here. I don't know if we've actually had any specific comments. Um, um, I need to ask that one lady a couple questions. Uh, okay, we will. Yeah, uh, did you have a specific question, all the I, have, I have a specific okay. question. Yeah. Um, who is it that you would? I'd like to ask the young lady back there if she would come up to the podium. Yes. Wit Ma'am Cheryl Wittenauer. Wittenauer. Uh -huh. Wittenauer. Ms. Wittenauer. Okay, Ms. Wittenauer. Yes, ma'am. Um, so my question is, I've heard over and over again about uh, the concern about community input. Mm -hmm. And it sounds as, as though you would put the time in. So were you making yourself available to be a part of the process? I didn't learn about it until June or July. I forget, it, it was well into the summer before I even learned about it. There was apparently a meeting that I didn't attend that, in which it was broached, so in all honesty, I could have done better, I guess, by one month. But once, it, by the time it became known and kind of advertised, as it were, on Tower Grove South Neighborhood Association Facebook page, it felt very much like it was a done deal, in all honesty. It was all sewn up, and I remember seeing it on Tower Grove South Facebook, and I'm like, what? Like, what is this? Like, there's been no discussion of this. Then once there was, then there was a meeting held, and I guess that we had, if you could call it, a, it wasn't really a public forum. It was like a, there was a neighborhood association meeting in which it was talked about, it was discussed, and the developer spoke. He made his talking points, as did the older woman, and there was, there was some lively conversation, I will say, but the meeting, did not go on and on. The meeting was like an hour and a half long. Questions were kind of cut. Um, it, would, it was obvious that, we, that the community had lots of questions and we should have had another meeting, but that didn't happen. Then we quickly went into this community benefits agreement, this conversation about having a community benefits agreement and picking people at random, like, okay, these, the developer, the neighborhood, you know, the, the business association and, all these kind of pro-development people, and then three or four neighborhood citizens were picked at random, you know, out of a hat. Um, and Do you know whether or not they actually lived in the neighborhood? I, I believe that they did, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I think you covered it for me. Um, <clears throat> it's so hard to get investment in the city. 
you, you may think it's easy, but it's not easy. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things I try to do is to try to let people know, at least for me, you need to talk to my neighborhood first. If they don't want the development or they don't like the design, nothing's going to happen. And I just think that's a real important thing because I think he has a good product here overall. But based on neighborhood input early on, without all of these other things attached, I think you all would have been okay. You would have came out with a good product early on and everybody would have been happy. Uh, so uh, it's unfortunate for the neighborhood. It's unfortunate for the developer that he's in the middle of this. He's being held hostage by this uh, agreement that seems like a lot of people don't even know anything about. Uh, and uh, it, I appreciate you all taking the time to come down because we don't know this. We sure. Don't, we don't know any of this. Mm -hmm. And that's why I tell residents, always speak up, always declare your position, and don't worry about me because I serve you. I don't serve my own interests. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, thank you for coming. Well, thank you for that. I do, I will just add that I think that this whole process could have benefited, pardon the pun, if we, there had been a more full-throated neighborhood conversation, Absolutely. neighborhood discussion. We did not really have that. At the, the day of the meeting, the evening of the meeting, when we, as, as Tower Grove South Neighborhood Association, took the vote, there was a presentation one more time by by the developer and, and the older woman and the business association and there was no one there to present the downside of this. We did not have an opportunity to converse about this. It was uh, a vote and that was it. And I saw people there that I have never seen before taking a vote, so go, whatever that means. Thank you. Okay, I, um, uh, unless somebody, I'm gonna make a couple comments and then I'm gonna open it up to you know, uh, the idea is, is that we try to be proactive in these things. I'm trying to read through the tea leaves here. I think there's, among some of the comments of our colleagues up here on the uh, committee, I think, um, and Alderman from the 24th, you certainly made me aware of something that I was uh, unaware of with your um, citing a state statue. Uh, I think um, there's a, a desire by the committee to, to be involved in community benefit agreements. It was kind of my intent to, to begin taking that up, um, you know, uh, here in the near future after we uh, uh, made a little bit more progress on our performance measure project. I thought, you know, if we are going to visit community benefit agreements, we should probably do it in the context of, of understanding what we're trying to do. And I, I thought we would probably you know, have some hearings. I think uh, the alderman from the 16th voiced concerns about kind of control and, um, you know, procedures in place so that we can properly monitor and um, um, supervise those. I think the alderman from the 24th made some comments um, that certainly I was not aware of uh, as far as state statute goes. And, and I think uh, the sentiment uh, that he shares is probably shared by other members on the committee as well. Um, I, my thought is, is, is that we should probably, you know, um, take the community benefit agreement and either discuss that, you know, expressly, or, or I don't know. I, my sense is, is there's not support on the committee right now to support this project without with the committee benefit agreement as is. Oh, based on Chairman that Rody, that needs to go. It, Chairman Rody, yeah. um, what I am willing to do um, is go back to the entities that have negotiated the community benefit agreement, um, ask them if they are willing to tear this up um, in exchange for decreasing the abatement amount to 90%. Um, and so I would um, ask that we hold the bill and hopefully perhaps next week if we get this rectified and if I can have those conversations with our community and then come back and pass a bill uh, without a community benefit agreement. Um, I think that's probably a good starting point. So um, what I think we probably should do, um, uh, Dale, or yeah, and here I'm asking, the, oh, I'm always overreaching my, my uh, purview here, but I think what we need to do uh, until we develop a community benefit agreement,
policy for the whole city is preclude those um, going forward. So I would presume that we can go ahead and insert a paragraph or something in all new board bills that come at least before my committee, and I would suggest doing it before neighborhood development that would preclude any payments to any third parties that are not expressly included in the board bill. Does that make sense? Sure, sure. Yeah. I, I uh, you know, I, I'm sure, you know, our attorneys can put something together that would be in that direction. Is everybody on the committee kind of in agreement that that's, I mean, and I have done similar types of things in the past, so I have violated the, the spirit of that. Uh, historically, I want to, well, the, I don't want to be portray portrayed as a hypocrite, but uh, I think since we're in this process right now, we need to um, kind of close the door on that until we sort this all, stuff all out. And Is there any objection to anybody on the committee with that? I thought? think that we can do that as long as it's not uh, attached to a bill being approved. If you've got a project that's already out here working and the communities are working together, then that has nothing to do with anything. Well, I would say pa everything that, from yeah. this point forward, we need to. Nothing you know, attached to a bill. Yeah, so anything that's already, you know, I mean, if it's approved, it's approved, and there's nothing we can do about right. it. No, but anything no. that comes before us, right. if there's an outside agreement, we need to have the outside agreement as a, need to be referenced as an addendum to the, to the board bill so that we're all aware of what it is. I don't think that that should happen or would happen prior to us coming up with a citywide process, but at least in the interim, we, we want to preclude that. You know, I'm, I'm not that. quite clear, though. You're, you're saying maybe putting something in the bill that precludes the community be, be, uh, betterment agreement, yeah, but, yeah, what, but what, I think yeah. Alderman, David, no, Alderman I, Davis is saying I think we, we're saying we don't want to do that? No, we're saying the oh, same thing. I think okay. Alderman okay. Davis is, is saying if you us. pass something, you know, if there's something like that dangling out from before, there, there's nothing we're going to be able to do. But okay, so we're talking about a new bill. Any, any new bills going okay. forward, we should go ahead and have uh, provisions in it that would preclude community benefit agreements until okay. we've adopted a citywide policy. Okay. Does okay. That make sense? okay. 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 That sounds good. All right. So if there's, uh, if, don't do is there, I'm sorry, you know, why don't we go ahead? Is there any other particular concerns by the committee that we want to go ahead and address? We, you know, I, uh, Alder Woman, I would hope you understand. I'm yes. sorry, I, I inter interrupted the president. Uh, ahead, Mr. Mr. President. Chairman, I, uh, the other thing that I'd like to do across this time we have before we uh, take another look at the bill is to really get a handle on the financials. I think uh, SLDC, we need to get some additional information from them. Uh, I personally would like to see the model that's being used and um, uh, seeing the, the information change from one spreadsheet to another on this project uh, would cause me concern down the road if we have not properly vetted that model to make sure that that model is indeed what we need and uh, uh, make sure that we have some constraints around it. So I would like to, like to have an opportunity to look at the financials and, the, and to see you know, if there is indeed a requirement for a tax abatement with the community benefits agreement removed. Um, uh, Mr. President, I think that's certainly your prerogative. I think one of the concerns that it was uh, expressed during our, our, in, our hearings on the incentive reform resolution was the, you know, both the complexity of the model and the fact that we only have one person who, who knows yeah. how to use it. Yeah. A and uh, we have shared that information, you know, with uh, both the, uh, you know, our, our current financial analysts as well as um, our executive director that we're going to have to build in some redundancy and I think you know Jonathan yeah. I'm, I'm trying not to be critical I mean yeah. it's and this a very is complex model but we need to go ahead and make it a little bit more we you know where we, we get the same answer from two different people using it a, a, absolutely absolutely and um, I think this is a point at which we must take that up uh, if we, and this isn't, this isn't any uh, slight against, uh, you know, SLDC at all or anything like that. Uh, and it, mistakes happen, right? But uh, we're making a lot of big decisions here and it would 
it, we need to make sure that we have all the proper information when we're making those decisions. So if we can bring, build in some redundancy so that uh, our financial analyst has a copy of it, um, I think we also need to understand the formulas, the structure within it, what's the, um, what's the process for changing it, uh, and those types of things. We really need to have that information since we and, are relying so much on like that model. Have that shared? Would you like to share it with our financial analyst? No, financial analyst. Our, yes. our, so you yes. want to have our financial analyst. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, Mr. Holland, Holland's working with Jonathan. Absolutely. And I, and I think that uh, I think that uh, yeah, and I think that that would help you also because you know if indeed you make an error in the future or Mr. Holland makes an error, you guys can check each other. And I think that's really important. But ultimately, that will assure that we're getting all the appropriate information. So just so I fully understand it, you would like to have, would you like to have Mr. Hollis present at the next meeting saying that, you know, confirming the findings or? Yeah, he, he, he does not have to be present at the next meeting, but uh, I would like to have him have access to uh, that model uh, and have those models be separate, separate so that uh, so that if something happens in the formula and the sale on on this one, it is not going to affect the one that he has, and and, and so on and so forth. And uh, then we would have that second set of eyes to assure that we indeed have good information uh, moving forward. Since we're relying so much on that model, it's I think it's absolutely a necessity that we have some redundancy. Okay, so we'll, we'll get uh, Jonathan and, and Mr. Hollis together so they both understand exactly where we're coming from. And could you use the new numbers we talked about? The 90 percent? And the new rental rates that you talked about? I don't think they've changed, yeah. I, I thought you said the unit size. size changed, yeah. Okay, okay. 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 I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. We can't hear for the record. We can't hear. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, but I don't want it. He Mr. Mulberry. Mul Mul I, I think Hello. they just wanted you to repeat the answer so that uh, the alderman from the 22nd could hear you. Sure. Um, very quickly, the, the rental rates have remained the same throughout the building as on a cost per square foot basis. We just removed some of the internal core factor, which essentially would have been non-rentable space uh, for amenities for the building, and by spreading that out on two floors instead of one, so uh, one floor will have the bike parking and one floor will have the, the recreation room, um, we were able to change the layout of the units themselves so that we had four units that were smaller square footages and two, some of the two bedrooms and one bedrooms gained square footage, but if okay. you take the net rental per square foot, that has remained the same. Okay. I'm good. Uh, Alderman from the 22nd, did you have another Yeah, I had, uh, I had some observations and questions for the, the sponsor. Um, first of all, I, I'm glad you attached it to the bill because it created a lot of discussion and I think it opened up the eyes to a lot of committee members about CBA, which really makes me want to go back and do even more digging on, you know, best practices. But some of the testimony that I heard was a little bit alarming, and maybe I misunderstood the conversation, but what I heard in the testimony was that there was a select group of people to represent the community, a few to be part of the whole community. And in the spirit of a community benefit of agreement, why would you, why would a process eliminate so many members of a community, whittle it down to just a few? So what it, what it was is kind of different entities, the business association and the neighborhood association took representatives because they understood if we were trying to negotiate a legally binding document with 100 people, I mean, we, it was difficult for them to even get 12 people around a table to agree on anything. And so they were liaisons kind of to represent the community around the discussion table. Right, but when I think about doing neighborhood planning, we have quite a few groups of people. We have every stakeholder that is involved in that whole process. So you could easily have 100 or 200 people in the room, and you certainly want all voices to be heard. Mm -hmm. The challenge I would have with a process like that, if it's random, then voices would not be heard. Um, 
I'm not convinced that that's a fair way to so it represent was, a neighborhood. I, listen, yeah. okay. No, so I understand. So I understand it starts big, and I'm sure my, the old woman from the 19th Ward who has exceptional experience and all this stuff could probably attest to this. The, you have many, many meetings oftentimes, mm -hmm. and the first meeting is 300 people. It sounds the yeah. alarm, and then people go and they listen, and they say, okay, this is, you know, not harmful, I'm going to check out and other people are really involved and then you get down to a few and then you chart and you come up with priorities, what do you think, what do you think, and you just will it all down and get an agreement. Mm -hmm. um, so certainly there's a process, mm -hmm. that, uh, a normal process in place to do that. And I, I think that you cheat members of the community when you just create a committee because then it's not as transparent as it could be. And I understand the whole point of having certain representations, and, and that's kind of good when you form in a neighborhood association, you know, because you don't want a neighborhood association with 100 people, and so you try to get people from different blocks and good representation as a committee or a group. But if you truly want to do a community benefit agreement that benefits an at-large community, all voices, I would think, need to be heard. I, I just found that kind of challenging in that process I mean, of how this was developed. No, I agree. I mean, the, the Neighborhood Association, I know it took them a while to figure out, you know, how do we make sure that we have people around the negotiation table that really do represent a, a wide swath? Um, and we ended up with, you know, social workers, teachers, um, I'm trying to remember all of the skill sets that were around the table, but it ended up you know, representing a pretty large um, area across the ward, and I, I have all the backgrounds on folks, but a pretty uh, large variety of viewpoints as well. And, and I know that committee kept reporting back to the neighborhood as they were engaging in discussions and getting feedback, and, um, and you know, they did some door-to-door -door canvassing, they did, you know, a, a lot of volunteer work. The problem with that process, it's not transparent. I mean, I can go out and canvass with a survey, and based on how I want the results to be, I can record what I want to record, versus people being inside a space, the same space, and doing a survey. Would you agree? I do. I mean, we, we had uh, a couple of meetings where we had public comment as well. Um, I, you know, I, I don't want to speak for the negotiation group, but I think a lot of them felt like they were hearing the same thing um, at those meetings. And if you're hearing the same thing, then you know maybe let's try a different way. And that's why they decided to do door to door. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Is there anything else that someone on the committee would like to th hear about or, or contemplate before next week? Okay. Well, we will, uh, I'll have to check my schedule and everything as far as our availability. I, we uh, appreciate everybody's, uh, we usually try to keep the Wednesdays. Uh, we were, they had conflicts tomorrow. So uh, in deference to the alderman from the 15th, who was in a hurry to hear this, I scheduled it for Tuesday so we could get it in this week. We will go ahead and uh, I, I think it'll be next Wednesday, but I have to just check my calendar before then and we'll be, hopefully having the announcement by Friday, so. Thursday. Okay. Thursday. 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 <laughs> Which was the other reason why it was confusing this week. So if there's no other comments, the alderman from the 7th had a bill board, had a board bill before us. However, ready? he um, uh, he had uh, requested that we continue it. So we may very well bring that up next. Do, did, was that a, Dale, was that a posting requirement uh, for? Well, I, I think, it is, so I think we can say we've opened the public hearing, and I don't think there's yeah. anyone here is to speak to it. Is there anyone here who would like to speak to whatever that board bill number is? 181. 181. Okay. okay, we'll consider this 181 publicly heard for purposes of uh, legal uh, requirements, but then we'll come back and hear it in more detail next week then. Okay, good. Or it might be, we have another meeting scheduled the 29th. We'll see. We, we need to make sure the developer can, can uh, sit in on that. Okay. Uh, no, I, mine's holding, I'm holding that till later in the month as well. Thank you. That, uh, if that's it, then I'll adjourn the meeting today. Thank you all for, for coming. Thank you.